itself. Um, this is our search class that we do. Okay. So this is uh, the first part of it. It's a it's a mixture of a hands-on and um, lecture portion. So our students will come in and they'll get the lecture, and then we go out and we do all the hands-on and practice everything that we learned. So wonderful. So Sean was really really kind and kind of tweaked his entire program just for this uh, setup right here that we're doing tonight. And then he's actually allowing us to put this towards the Schwartz uh, content. So thank you for that, Sean, really appreciate it. And I'm gonna let you kind of talk about each slide. I know we have the notes and stuff, and you just let me know when you're ready to move on, okay? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if anybody's got questions or any of the other instructors, you know, feel free to add your stuff in there, so. Um, as, a, as you see, the, the class is entitled Searchable versus Survivable. Now, there's a lot of emphasis placed on terms that we use in the fire service to decide like what we're going to do, whether we're going to make this search or not. But this is more of a class that is based off of making your decisions backed with education, um, which is super important, you know, um, and, and not really listening to opinions, more as guiding your actions based off of what you know. Um, you know, and, and fortunately, some of that has to do with experience levels. So we'll talk about all that. So uh, as we move on, just keep that in the back of your mind that that's what this is, is a question that you're asking yourself, like, can I make this happen right now? Um, so if you want to move on with the with the slides, Jordan, we can do that. Okay. So one of the biggest things that I tell everybody is that we all have uh, contributing factors, right? But we need to understand what those are. Everyone's are different. Um, so I'll open it up to the students uh, if they want to put up some questions or anything. I don't know if you can see it in the shared screen, but um, I'd like to know what, what they consider to be some of their contributing factors and we can kind of expand upon that. So are you, by, okay. by contributing factors, are you talking about like really like what you bring to the table as far as experience and? So exactly. So that's that's what I want, right? Because I say contributing factors, people consider that to be different. What I think contributing factors are are things that either uh, improve your performance or hinder your your performance. Um, so there's there's different things that I personally feel that we have in the fire service that either uh, make or break us in the success realm. Uh, so just curious what other people may feel those are, uh, and then we can talk about what I feel uh, they are. So, um, I, I think first and foremost, uh, well, actually, do you want me to take this to chat or just be vocal? Sure, you can be vocal. Yeah, vocal okay. is fine. So um, I think first and foremost, when, when you're talking about putting yourself, your life on the line and, and your brother's and sister's lives on the line, um, knowing your limits, knowing what you don't know, is critical but and 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 making sure that you you're the guy the guys and gals in your department know that um but i'll also have a willingness to learn i mean don't be afraid to jump in but know your limits whether it's um you know some of us guys on the on if you're on a volunteer department you're older maybe you're not as in, in shape as you were back when you were in your 20s um you know hump some tools or or run a pump you know it's it, it just know your limitations and it, you know if you if you go outside of that you're going to put yourself and, and others at, at risk right and i agree with you 100 percent. so thank you for that how long do you have in the fire service about two years <laughs> two years hey that, that that's okay that's all right the reason i ask is because that that hits a lot of what i feel are our contributing factors as well so there's three big things for me um, time, obviously. How long does it take you to get to the emergency scene, right? Mm -hmm. How long does it take you to formulate a plan and get into action, right? Stretch in line, throwing ladders, just formulating your 360, all of that. That is time. Unfortunately, the longer we we go with that, um, the less of a positive outcome we're going to have because that time doesn't belong to us. It belongs to them. So when we're sitting in the front yard and we're messing around, because we didn't train on how to mask up or throw ladders or stretch line properly, right? That, that all adds time into when we can get into action. So kind of touching a little bit else on what you said is the knowledge part, right? Do you truly understand what it is you're being asked to do? Uh, have you learned from past fires? Have you even been to an incident that's requiring you uh, to do what you're doing right now? Uh, are you current and up to date on best practices or is you just kind of back into that minimalist mindset of well, I went through the fire academy and their training is supposed to be what I operate off of. 
Uh, and then obviously the third one is, is your ability, right? So that, that strikes on like your physical fitness, uh, what, what you can accomplish with the staffing levels because everybody's staffing levels are different. Um, and overall, like what is your level of experience, mm-hmm. right? We don't, I can't expect you to make a positive assessment on something if you've only, if maybe this is your first fire or you've never really been to a fire that's required you to go into search and rescue mode. Um, so we, we like to hit on all that because, you know, you never know when these calls are going to happen. So uh, those for me are contributing factors. Any of the instructors have any other uh, contributing factors that they think? Um, real quick, actually, real quick, Sean. Um, so contributing factors, uh, a lot of people always talk about, um, and I'm, excuse me, as I'm, as I'm looking down, just looking, writing notes or not so I don't forget, right? A lot of people want to talk about time of day. Um, uh, is, the, is the patient a... Or, or the victim of VIP, you know, like, uh, is it a kid? Is it a, is it, is it a homeless guy? Um, those types of things that, that will contribute to the response of how you're going to fight this fire. And I, and I just go out there and I'm going to put it out there for people to just ask themselves why I, I don't dif- differentiate on how I fight fire. I don't differentiate on how I, on how I perform my EMS duties. Uh, it, could, it could legitimately be the President of the United States or it could be a homeless dude. I'm not going to let either one of them die. Um, so, you know, I always go back to sports analogies, you know, like uh, the greatest of all times, you know, the, the, the Michael Jordans of the world, the Peyton Manning of the world, the Derek Jeter's of the world will probably scrimmage you. And during a scrimmage, you'll never know that it's a scrimmage. They're always going to play to win. Uh, so... Just uh, for me, uh, you know, I don't, the only, and I, and I agree with Sean uh, wholeheartedly, the only thing that changes is your time of response. You know, like if you have a two minute response as opposed to a 20 minute response, what you're going to do on the fire ground is going to change. But as far as like how I'm going to attack the fire based on whether it's a, uh, a, 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 a vacant house, quote unquote, whether it's a kid in, a kid in trap, whether it's a, a 90 year old in trap, I'm still going to be uh, uh, balls to the wall, essentially, you know, so fighting the fire, how I know how to fight fire. So that's just my thinking, my two cents on contributing factors there. Yeah, no, that makes sense. What about uh, John and Chris? You guys got anything to add? Um, physical fitness, I think, is a is a big contributing factor. Um, I I personally am trying to train for smoke divers, so I I'm trying to train for a higher caliber of you know level of fitness training. So for me, it, it's different compared to everyone else, but I still believe that our job is physically demanding, just like in the military uh, when they go out and go to serve and protect our country. These guys are not just lazy asses. They're not. Uh, they're not just sitting on their couches, staring at a TV set all day. Um, they're they're out there, you know, training their butts off. They're out there becoming physically fit, adapting their bodies to an environment that they're not used to. And I think that uh, plays a huge contributing factor, especially for us, because we're constantly in environments that uh, play a major toll on our bodies. And um, we just hired uh, five new people in our organization. Two of them are on 12-hour shifts. Um, one of them right now is rotating through my house at this point, and he, he he's an exceptional employee so far. He's doing very well. One of the things that he lacks is physical fitness um, and being able to train his mindset when he gets into that, what I call the red level. Um, I, I categorize my levels between green, yellow, red, and black. Black meaning that you have lost pretty much all subconscious and you're not thinking clearly. Um, and your heart rate is elevated way above 200. Uh, your red zone target is usually in anywhere between 100 and 130 beats a minute to 180 beats a minute. But you're, you're still within that subconscious mind frame, but your body's just being physically exerted and it's taking a huge demand. Um, on your performance and that's where being physically fit being able to train and just even do simple it doesn't have to be an elaborate training or exercise it could be simply just going out in full gear throwing ladders full gear force and doors full gear pulling lines and just getting your body used to that especially down here in florida florida i mean it's summer all year round everyone knows that you know so it can even during the summertime it can get up to 100 degrees and for us that's a different ball game because we have to adapt our bodies to that it's it definitely takes a toll on you so i think 
uh, when it goes to contributing factors, physical fitness is definitely one of those uh, key aspects that we need to be aware of. Awesome. What about you, John? Um, I'm going to touch on a couple factors. You know, Chris touched on that, and that's a tactical resiliency. You know, if you, anybody picked up that book from Rick George and the two other guys, exactly Absolutely. would be spot on regarding what, what's going on with that. Uh, I want to talk about time, but two other things you talked about was uh, knowledge and experience. You can't change the knowledge and experience when you're riding to the, to the run, to the call, but that's done ahead of time. The time aspect, and I'm going I'm to come at it from an officer's perspective. Uh, if it's a two-minute response, what are you looking for? What's your size of factors? Uh, Pablo touched on it too. Uh, looking at, like, what's your building? What are you going to? What's your occupancy? Knowing what you're going to and running the Rolodex in your head of how we're going to respond and what we're going to do at that incident will set us in motion for where our potential victims are, especially for a structure fire of, hey, time of day, time of night, where, where are we going and where are we lo most likely going to find our, our victims. And later on, we're going to talk about numbers about where we're going to find them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you said that because that, that plays a role. Like, are you going to this run in your first two, maybe your second or third new? Where, where is this at? And how well do you know those areas in relation to yours? Absolutely. Yeah, those are those are the contributing factors right there that are big. Not necessarily, and just to clar clarify, not necessarily the uh, hey, uh, uh, hey guys, we got to be on our game today because it's a pediatric. I'm, I'm I'm going to I'm going to search no matter if it's a pediatric or if it's a 90 year old. You know, so uh, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, John. But I want to touch on that as well. Um, me for more of a size up aspect for engine or truck. I'm, I'm looking at different uh, techniques. I'll throw this out there. Using Google, Google Street or Google, uh, Google Earth, I'm on a truck company. I'm a truck company captain. So I want to know if I got wires in the front of the building. If I got wires in the front of the building, what am I, what am I going to do? We're going to do ground ladders. Where are we setting up? If I'm able to pull that information up as we're responding in, it gives me a better size up factor of what building I have, what type of building, flat roof, pitch roof, you know, fire escape locations all sort of stuff that I'm able to yell out to the guys in the back as we're, as we're going down the road as and pulling up two minutes is a lot different than a five minute response in my city. We're, we're 3.2 square miles and we can be on scene in four minutes anywhere in our city. That's great. Yeah. So what happens when you go outside of your city? What are your response times look like that? Can you mutual aid, things like that. Maybe five to 10. It gives me a little more time to, uh, to dive into. I do, I call it research. I research the building if okay. I don't know, if I don't know it again, I love yeah. Google. I use my phone. I'll be pulling up on the tablets in the apparatus that we now have sure. uh, just to, just to see what we've got. Uh, if I know I'm going to the roof, I pull up Google earth. I want to see what, what's up there. Air and light shafts. I want to see if I've got, uh, if they got photoelectric rays, uh, uh, PV. Right. So it's, it sounds Thank like, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like uh, everyone can pretty much agree that uh, knowledge right, is, is a huge one, and um, time, right, what is your, your dispatch time and, and everything else like that, so, uh, Jordan, do you have anything to add before we move on to the next slide? Uh, I think it's culture, man, I was the culture of your organization, uh, you know, uh, Chris talked about working out and, and, you know, doing these little drills, yourself better, both physically and mentally, man, if your culture don't embrace that, you know, if uh, it's uh, Nick Martin always says, if you're a turd in the firehouse, you're probably a turtle. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's the way it rolls. You don't just snap a finger and you're a badass fireman, and you know you're. You have to put the time and the work into it because I, you know, for for me speaking personally, we don't we go to an EMS call every day. I go to a home every day. We can get at that, but. You know, the fires, a search, it's just not something I do all the time. That's a skill you have to keep up on. It's, it's, it's uh, one of those things where you might lose those fine skills, those little little yeah. things. You're not keeping Absolutely. up with culture, man. I think culture influences so much uh, when it comes to training and skills on the fire ground. Oh, it sure does, you know, because uh, – <clears throat> I don't know, one of my biggest pet peeves is the target solutions, right? Like, I, I hate those things. I understand that it's got a time and place, but it's not meant to replace putting your hands on tools or getting out there in your gear and doing this stuff, right? And uh, 
a lot of people say, I did my training for the day. You know, sometimes you log in and you say, it looks like, oh, hey, I have all these checks on. It's like, well, when did I do physical fitness? I've only been here for an hour, but I've got two hours of physical fitness logged in already. Yeah. You know, so it's not a good, accurate assessment. Also, team building, right? Like, you, you really want to make sure that you've got team building. Um, and that's where that comes in, getting outside, getting in there, running through these drills. You know, you, I might have been off on my Kelly Day or something. You guys might have caught a job, and, you know, something crazy could have happened. I want to know about that, and I want to go out there and train on that so that if I get that position, then I'd be like, you know what? I've been, I've been here before in some way, right? Like, I've trained on this exact thing. Uh, granted every fire skin is different, but at least it sets you up for success instead of failure. So, um, that's huge, but yep. All right, moving uh, on. yep. Moving on. So you got the next one up there, Jordan it should be now. Yeah, there we go. All right. Nope. Next one. Next one. Moving on. Yep. Moving on. All right. So knowledge objectives, right? This is huge for me. Um, this is pretty much what we're going to look at, right? We're, we want to size up our search effort when we get there because our whole intent is to target our search, right? We will search everything at some point in this fire, but we have to identify what gets priority right now. And we don't have that much time to do that. So that's where we get to target our search, whether it be a VES or uh, whatever kind of search tactic that you employ to get that done. We need to have that mindset of saying, if I don't do this right now, I'm not going to be able to because once that spot or once that space is lost, it's lost. So is everyone else in there, right? So uh, getting on that quick and, and understanding why is it that you feel that way? What is it about that particular space that, that triggered in your mind that that's where I need to go first? Um, improving efficiency. That's where your training comes in, you know, doing the sets and reps. What we do, we have a dangerous job, you know, and, and the point of the whole thing is if, if we're not improving, we're not effective, right? Uh, I could do this search the same way I did it, you know, five years ago, but things have changed, you know, layouts of buildings may have changed, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then understanding our data, you know, UL and, and Firefighter Rescue Survey, like they give us a tremendous amount of information to go through. And, and we really need to understand what that means for us on the fire ground. So, I think the biggest thing is when we show up, we want to be able to use facts to guide our decisions and not fear. Uh, so identify your central space on that 360 when you show up. Anyone else? No, man, I think that's all solid, uh, solid points to, to make. And uh, I think the other thing is knowing your run district. I think that makes a huge point, knowing, knowing that I'm going to, for me, say I go to what we call it the village. Of my, my homes are going to be, that's an older village. My building construction is different compared to going to Laura Oaks, which is a thousands on up neighborhood. You know, my, my mindset might be a little bit different, still the same, but you know, my, my method of execution might be a little faster, different things along the, those points. Or I'm going up to my station two, which is a little more, little more ghetto-ish, not, not not scary, but you know, it's a little rougher neighborhood where I might I might be thinking of different styles of search where people might be hiding at and those types of things. So I think knowing your run district is, is a absolutely point. yeah, absolutely yeah. that's. That's a that's a huge point, and uh, just real quick, just to uh, emphasize what what Sean said, we should never make ever. It doesn't matter whether you work for for a, a, a small rural department or a large metro department. We should never ever make tactical decisions based off of fear. Knowledge gives you your tactical decisions. Never never fear. If you're if you're doing uh, any type of work off of fear, then uh, you need to get back to school a little bit. John. District familiarization is key. Knowing what's going on uh, in your area, your primary and your secondary, knowing, knowing street construction issues, building construction issues. There's many a time that we'll be driving down the road and I'll have my chauffeur stop. We'll, uh, we'll get out and meet up with a GC that's working on a house and ask, hey, what are you doing? What renovations? We always heard about that. Renovations kill firefighters because mm -hmm. it creates voice spaces that we don't usually know about. From that building it may be a type one excuse me i'll go with the type five or type three and then now they're adding things or changing things yeah um then, then john then you run into building code updates you, know, you might run into 
a sprinkler system that just got upgraded. You never knew there was a sprinkler system in that building until they did the, the update or a standpipe system or whatever. You're, at, you're absolutely right on that, uh, Jordan. And the just getting out there and knowing your district and knowing – forcible entry issues uh, again truck company stuff for me we have uh rear access issues we have buildings that are right next to each other and that we have gates and locks and uh how do we get in so play that how-to game a lot in your district of what task you want to do and what and how you get there and get it done is a is a great game that we play on the truck all the time absolutely uh, uh one of the uh one of the guys that's uh watching he said situational awareness is a, is is good and i agree with that 100 percent. you got to know what's going on and i think situational awareness is also expecting what might happen 10 minutes 20 minutes down the road of your fire for sure yeah, yeah that, that comes with knowledge and experience though yeah that's you're not the guy right fresh out of uh fresh out of rookie school is not going to understand what's coming down the line in 10 15 minutes on a wood frame structure that's been burning for uh, 15 20 minutes already and uh, what are we going to do? What's our change? That's more of the office. In your man. Of fighting those fires. I got, I got one thing. Can I, uh, can I throw one thing in here real quick? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So uh, <clears throat> understanding your response district, also understanding your mutual aid district. I don't know about you guys. But we're at here. We rely very heavily on mutual aid. Uh, back when I first joined you know, volunteer in New Jersey, back when I first joined 20 some years ago, if you called mutual aid company to your town, you guys were fuck ups that you had to call mutual aid company to your, your town for a house fire. But now it's got to the point where, as soon as as soon as the neighboring town is, is is dispatched for a fire, all these other towns, including my town, are all kind of gearing up because you know you're going. So you need to know how to not only your response district, you, you know you have to understand their response district. The biggest thing that you have to realize too is making sure that those companies know how to operate when they come to work with you. So, you know, I, I'm sure that everybody has neighboring departments that you guys may go mutual aid to. I know, I don't know John, but I know his department. Passaic always goes to Patterson. So I'm sure, John, how does that work with you guys? We're going to Patterson and Patterson coming to you guys. Is that something uh, you really relate to as far as mutual aid? I mean, Passaic may do one thing, Patterson does another thing. But as far as you, your, your truck companies, you're, you're, and the, the point that I'm trying to get is you should you should come up with a, a common denominator between whether it's engine or truck and to know that your engine companies are doing this and their truck companies are doing that and vice versa. So it's a, you know, a, a happy, a happy marriage when you guys are operating. Is that something that you can relate to John? Absolutely. And it starts with the run card. I would say knowing that um, my ladder truck is what is goes mutual aid to the city of Patterson. Uh, my ladder truck goes, mutual aid to Clifton. But when we are calling for mutual aid, because we're a smaller city, uh, I know we're going to get a, potentially right now, we're getting a one and one from uh, from the city of Patterson, and we're going to get uh, an engine from Clifton. And just knowing what, what their roles are and what we're going to do. A lot of times we're going to go back, fill a station, and if it's a large enough fire in Patterson, we're going right to work. Uh, we've had uh, lately, our guys have been uh, fairly busy uh, at work and it's it's interesting this this new the new new that we're in with covid we have a lot of more people in buildings and I, I it's about that size up feature we have family members now with more family in their built in their physical home because of this so now you have to do an, a better accountability um it's just something that, that that's out there and that we're going to start seeing potentially with the aftermath of uh this uh this virus yeah, I think that's a good point there, John. You know, everything's kind of changed for us at this point. So, um, you know, you almost have to assume in, in search specific, you know, we almost have to assume at this point that if we're able to, we're making search. Someone's probably in that house, you know, with these quarantines and things like that. So um, this is something that I think that if you haven't had the opportunity to do very much, um, you're probably going to find yourself doing a lot more than you thought uh, mm -hmm. at, at this time in our fire service. So. All right, ready to move on? Yep, let's do it. All right. All right, so the next one here, um, somebody, I don't care who, one of the students, somebody with uh, some experience or maybe not a whole lot of experience, doesn't matter, unmute your mic and give me a size up on this picture.
not all at once. <laughs> all right. I, I get it. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, at, at the arriving, I say I got a uh, single family wood frame private dwelling. I got heavy fire shown from the A and the B side. That'd be my standard, uh, <clears throat> my standard uh, size up. I'd also say that it appears that we have a, uh, a handicap ramp going on the uh, brow side of the building as well. Awesome. So what does that tell you about this particular incident? We might have a person inside that's not ambulatory. Right. Or they're, they may not be ambulatory. They may not move all that well. Right. And what, what are some things that we're always taught? Like when you do size up, right? Oh, there's no cars in the driveway. The grass is kept up. Like, you know, all that good stuff. But unfortunately, going back to, to the previous point, you can't really use those anymore. Right. There's so many factors that go into what's happening. You know, uh, obviously, if this person with the handicap ramp can't drive, but whoever else lives there to assist with them had to go run errands to get that medication or whatever. Yeah, it's gonna look like no one's home. That doesn't mean they're not in there, right? So gathering this quick information on your 360 for your search size up is imperative. We have to do that and we have to get those little clues. So good job about catching that. I intentionally picked this picture for that reason. So I was trying to see who would catch that, especially on that 360. Um, I personally feel there's a lot of searchable space in, in this particular building. Um, and you know, that goes back to waiting on your resources to get there. What are you going to do? What is your first due unit arriving in? Is it an ambulance? Is it a truck company? Is it an engine? You know, or is it the battalion chief's vehicle? What is it? And is that going to hinder you from doing your search? Um, all those things add up. So, uh, if anybody else has anything to add on that picture, please do so. I'd be curious to see what uh, any other considerations would be. The the layout of the inside of the building, knowing your knowing your neighborhoods and your layouts of you know you go in that front that front door, you may have stairs straight ahead of you. You're probably going to have a room to your right. You know, kitchen's probably going to be to the rear. Just knowing the layout of those buildings in that neighborhood will facilitate your search, whether you're going to try VES or you're going to actually get that line in between the, the fire and the victim's potential. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Dane Fitzgerald. Yeah, absolutely, right? So, you know, if you look up on the roof, it looks like there might be a little bit of snow up on there. Um, he says could possibly be a basement fire, right? That's where knowing a lot of stuff comes in, right? Knowing your fire behavior, your flow path, your building construction, all of it. it it's all relevant, not to just fire attack, but to, to us as searchers, right? We need to take every bit of that into account um, because if we just start popping windows and taking doors and we're just diving in, that might not be the most effective thing. You know, we might be making it worse for them and really bad for us too. So. You just got to kind of slow it down and not get so focused on the fire um, and, and take that big picture in it and really focus our efforts where we can do the greatest good. Uh, John, Pablo, anybody got anything else to add? No, brother, you guys hit that. You guys hit your points pretty well. Good catch on the handicap ramp there. Um, that's something that people won't, a lot of people don't do um, their, their tunnel vision on that fire. Um, you know, we go back to obviously, you know, the basics of reading smoke, which is, you know, uh, to quote Chief Lasky, obviously, you know, don't be a moth to that flame. Don't look at that flame. You know, what is the smoke telling you? Well, what's the building telling you, obviously? So good catch on that uh, on that handicap ramp. Just yeah, the absolutely. size of the exterior of the, the, the building. So you see some low-hanging wires. You do see a chain-link fence around the property. So things to be aware of just before you even get to the structure. Bingo, right? Because that all makes, makes a huge difference for us, right? We're all amped up. We're ready to go. We want to get in there. We want to kick ass and, and do a great job. And, and of course, we all want to be the first one to find someone and pull them out, right? That's what we're, we're there for. We're firing, right? However, if we don't take that moment to, to pace ourselves and, and keep an eye on what's going on around us, we're not going to do anybody any good if we, if we get hurt because now we need to be rescued, right? So, absolutely. Um, I don't that's know a good guys, I appreciate that. I don't know if you guys can see uh, in the picture, but towards the bottom by the fence is the inch and three-quarter hand line. Yeah. Uh, positioning of your engine, you've got that chain link fence. That's a big deal. Um, you know, uh, one of the guys said, one of the guys in the chat said, judging by the picture, it's a moment of time, right? You know, we don't know the story or anything. We're just talking about what we see here. 
water supply? Am I going to set up for the draft? Am I going to set up for a relay pump? Like, there's so many things in these situations. You're making decisions in, a, in, a, in an instant, you know, and you have, to, you have to absorb the entire scene. There's all, it looks like a wire coming across the top. You know, those are, those are things that, that factor into your position. What plan A, B, and C for your fire? So, just do. Jordan, just to touch on what you said regarding the fence and that stri- that line, that's perfect. Engine pulled past. Leave room for the truck. Even though it's one and a half stories, you never know what you're going to have to do. Whether you might have to vent or whatever else. The other issue is how many people have just thought about throwing that line over the fence, right? Right. Why make the long stretch uh, around? You can go on a diagonal. Just little things over time, and that comes with the experience of running calls and seeing what the senior guys are doing and how they're instructing. Absolutely. Uh, just, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Excuse me. Just for clarification, uh, and everybody in this class, we have all walks of life in the fire service from uh, more densely populated areas in the world. Uh, you may not run a, a ladder company, but you need to think ladder company uh, function. That was one thing that Pablo and I talked about for a while. You might respond with two engines and a tanker to this fire. Um, you still need to think about these things down down the line of, of your fire scene. So yeah. So if I may, there real quick, Jordan, real quick. West Ohio, there's only a few places that run a ladder truck, and we're not actually we don't run dedicated companies uh, in our area. We have to. We our staffing's kind of dynamic, and we respond with more rules, and then we basically pump them up and get on the scene. So just just for that clarification. Um, Absolutely. Um, yeah, if I may, real quick on that, can you yeah. guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I couldn't agree more on that. There's always there's always a debate, always especially a debate, especially um, in in not large metro areas. You know, like oh, uh, a truck company. Um, we we don't we don't have high rises. We don't have this. We don't need a truck company. Uh, or we're engine dominated department or whatnot. I work for an engine dominated department. Um, having said that, so our as our apparatus arrive on scene, first, the, just the way that, 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 that we fall, our, our first two engines gonna be suppression, our second two engines gonna be water supply, our third two engines gonna be truck company operations. So if, you are, if you're listening to me right now and you work for one of these departments where you are an engine dominated department, I'm gonna tell you right now, you have truck companies in every battalion and every district coming to you. It is the third two engine. As, as you are doing, if you're doing anything other than putting water on the fire, you're doing truck work. If you're searching, you're doing truck work. You're forcing entry, you're doing truck work. You're pulling ceiling, you're doing truck work. So just keep that in mind for all the guys that say, oh, we don't need truck company operations. We don't, we don't need trucks. We don't need this. Um, a truck work is a skill. It is not a truck. It's a skill. Um, and, you, and that picture right there for that particular house, you could debate how to fight that fire seven ways from Sunday. You could go uh, uh, interior, transitional, this, fog this, uh, guidance per minute. Uh, whatever. You could debate that seven ways from Sunday. One thing you cannot debate from a truck company standpoint, from a from a from a from an ambulance suppression standpoint, is there is searchable space there. You need to get in there and search that house. That is words matter and size ups matter, and that right there is not a fully involved house. You need, we need to start getting into that mindset of understanding the differences between heavily involved, fully involved, because words matter to the incoming crews, to that third due truck company or third due engine, to that first due. Uh, ambulance that's going to do a search um you know so words matter right absolutely absolutely you said that perfect pablo and we're going to touch on that a little bit more and uh i absolutely love this discussion because that's that's kind of what we're here for you know getting getting people's minds rolling you know and, and trying to see what the what the best tactical decision is to make um so as we move on from here we're going to be doing more and more of of these you know so we'll add some more but i don't want to take up everyone's time so we'll just keep it moving jordan we'll go to the next uh two uh, unless anybody has something to add real quick that they didn't get a chance to yep you good jordan yes we're good all right so here we have fatal facts right so keep in mind as we go on through this uh these statistics have recently changed i have just not updated them yet so if you see something that's different i understand that it is, um, and it, it will be changed. But um, for the most part, they're, they're right in the ballpark. So when we look at that, over 60% of our fatalities are between 
uh, 20 hundred and 08 hundred. That's, that's important for me to know, you know, especially when it comes to searching. Cause when our fires come in, that's one of those huge things, right? Time of day. We talked about that earlier. Um, and then putting that in, how many fires have you had at that particular time of day? You know, when you've done that, how many times have you searched? Have you found somebody? Maybe you haven't, you know, um, all those, all those things uh, have to come into account, but our peak hours are from three to five. Cause that's when people are in their deepest sleep. Right. Um, and, and that's, that is something that I think we um, aren't doing a good enough job of dressing is paying attention to our times. Uh, you know, we get a daytime fire and we're like, Oh, it's probably during the day. Well, that's fine. Unless somebody works shift work, right? Like we all do. And you take a nap during the day, right? And all those things uh, add up to there. But I found it interesting to think that the, according to the U S fire administration, the, the leading factor in fire fatalities is because we are sleeping right now, whether that be lack of early warning or, or things like that, who knows, but you know, 48%, that that's, it's a significant number to be occurring between, you know, 11 o'clock and 7 AM, I think. So, um, you want to go to the next slide there, Jordan? Yeah, uh, if you could, Sean, can you write down uh, in the chats all of those websites that people can uh, go and, and go to, like Firefighter Rescue Survey and the U.S. Uh, Fire Administration? Yeah, yeah, those absolutely. In the chat, so people can copy and paste them. The biggest thing here, guys, I, I just want to put, I don't expect firemen to memorize numbers, but I expect you to memorize that people are creatures of habit, you know, and, and think about how you enter your house all the time. You need to think like that when you're going to someone's house. The front door may not always be the best door. That's not the door they always use. Maybe they use the side door or the back sliding door. If that homeowner is out in the front yard, ask them which door they frequently use, and that's probably the best place for your line to go. Think about an EMS call. You go inside, you go to the house, can't open the front door because there's a couch behind it. You know, those types of things. So really paying attention. EMS calls is the best surveillance you can have on your run district and i know firemen ems oh my gosh but man you are learning so much about your area if you just stop and open your eyes and kind of expand your thought process just a little bit that's just my little little blurb on that no that's good jordan because there's one thing that i will touch on that you know and this is actually a completely different class right and and i don't teach it if you want it contact ryan pennington he's great um but we talk about going in these houses and you're talking about exits and where people more or normally are. That is a key factor when we're talking about hoarding situations, right? Knowing where these people are because they're not going to be where they normally would be in a home that's not cluttered, right? Um, typically these time of days, if that's what we're, we're thinking in our mind, you know, Oh, well I read it that this time of day, they're statistically most likely to be in the bedroom. That's great. But this is a hoarding house. And their bedroom's probably packed full of stuff. So think about that. There's clues that key us into that this is a hoarding situation and that we might have to actually change up our search tactics to locate that victim. And one of the best ways to do that is actually stay on those trails. You know, that will lead you to them because that's how they move around their own house. Uh, so I just want to throw that in there for, for just a little, little thing to think about when you're doing your size ups as well. Yeah, the, the heavy, uh, talking about the heavy content, you're going to find them in the paths. You're not going to find them on the hoard itself or the heavy content. So you, again, EMS runs are going to be your best, best bet of knowing that they sleep in the lounge chair in the living room and they're not in the bedroom because the bedroom's now packed, you know? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Hey, before, before we move on, um, uh, actually, it's one of my battalion chiefs that I work with. He said that we have to, we have had to retrain our minds during, uh, hold on. We have retrained our minds uh, during this pandemic, kids and parents home during the day and sleeping till 10 to 11 a.m. And man, that's, man, that's spot on. That's, yeah. that's really changed our whole uh, anticipation of where people are at. Right? And it, and it does. And and that's, that's why I wanted to bring attention to that is, these numbers are great and these statistics are, but as we know, there's nothing definite on the fucker ground, especially. John, we're losing you, bud. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yeah. 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 The reception here is terrible. I'm sorry. Uh, what, what I'm saying is there's nothing definite on the fire ground, right? And, and that's including where we're going to find our victims. 
Right. So yeah, un yeah. understanding that, you know, if, if we trick ourselves and we take these numbers at face value and say, yep, this is where they're, they're going to be because the numbers say so, that may not be the case. So th this, this isn't to say this is where you must do your things um, or this is where you will find victims. This is just to tell you like, hey, these might be things you want to think about, whether it be time of day or percentage of people found in these areas. Um, you know, especially when you're trying to identify where your entrance points are going to be for this search. Uh, so don't take any of this after the class and say, well, you know, Sean said 60% of the time they're in their bedrooms or whatever, because, you know, the facts that we get, they're, they're only there because somebody filled out a survey, right? They had a, they had a rescue or, or something like that. Maybe they made a grab and it was fatal. But they took the time to fill out that survey. And, and right now, there's only 1,172 of those surveys filled out. Well, when we look at, on average, we have 3,000 fire fatalities a year. You know, that's, that's, a, that's about half that, that are being reported. So we can only go off of those numbers. Um, you know, and right now, I, I looked this morning, there's 899 civilian fire deaths. So what does that mean for us? Right. The numbers that we're currently seeing are based off of the last 500 surveys that were filled out. So there's still a couple hundred surveys that we're missing to get those numbers. So just stay cognizant of that as we move on right. and, and understand that. All right. I'm going to uh, move on after, uh, from the statistics so we can get uh, into the meat and potatoes of this. Yes, let's do it. All right. So here's something we Pablo touched on this. Right. We have to be careful what we say because our words have meaning. Every single one of those things up there, depending on who you ask, can mean the same thing. Right. But yet here we are in the fire service and we argue on what it means. Instead, if we just said that we're sizing up our search. Right. Everybody knows what that means. We're all on the same page there. If I ask somebody in this chat, what is survivability profiling? And I ask somebody else, I will get a different answer. Right. Because usually those words or what it means to that person. So I'm not saying not to use them. I'm just saying that if you are going to use them, make sure that you personally know what it means to you and that everyone else does too. Because if you're not, then you're running into that, that fine line of, you know, miscommunication. You know, if, if I said, why didn't we search this? And you said survivability profiling. My first question is going to be, well, what does that mean? Right? If you tell me, well, I'm not able to go into that space. And I'm going to say, well, that's, to me, that means that, you you were sizing up your search right you made it whatever it was you made that distinct decision that i can't make this happen right now i have to go to a different spot that i can because that spot's not i'm not able to operate in if i'm not able to operate in that spot chances of them being alive are probably slim right so just caution yourselves on what you choose to, to use and, and basing your actions off of those words alone anybody have anything to add on that um, I took a good uh, officer's class in Fort Lauderdale Fire Expo this or last year. Um, I can't remember his name. I'm horrible with names. I'm great with faces though. But um, but one of the battalion chiefs of Fort Lauderdale, uh, his terminology, um, which I'm I'm going to start adapting my to for myself is um, uh, getting away from uh, saying defensive attack over the radio he doesn't use that it's either interior or exterior attack um and i think that plays a major factor especially in my uh part of florida um it seems like everyone that comes onto the scene and says you know we're we're going into defensive mode everyone's guard kind of gets let down and really they're not seeing the big picture yet once they get on scene and they realize oh well it's just a heavy amount of fire in the front part of the building and they decided to go defensive, but as soon as they knock that down, then they're going to finish up and go interior. So that's why he likes using, um, you know, the time once on scene, I've got heavily involved alpha side of the structure, we're going to exterior attack. And then that, that's a cue and clue saying that, okay, they're going exterior attack first, and now they're going to transition to interior attack once they get that main body fire down. And I think that plays uh, into that terminology aspect of, um, still keeping that heightened sense of awareness um, for crews as they're rolling into the scene and not totally getting uh, uh, laxed as of yet once they hear defense. Yeah, I, I, you know, I couldn't agree with you anymore because 
I know that me personally, I've gone to fires where they say we're defensive, fully involved. And in your mind, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to show up and I'm going to sit outside, right? I'm just going to spray water on a bunch of stuff. And then you show up and you're like, whoa, this is not fully involved. And there's a ton of searchable space. And now everyone's frantic trying to figure out what happens. So that initial report sets the stage for everybody responding. No doubt about it. So. Chris, I want to I want to touch on exactly what you said. Uh, the word transition, transitional attack has been beaten up for the past three to five years. It's okay that we can knock the fire back so we can gain entry to get there. We have to be be able to get in to hit the search or searchable or survivable spaces, but we have to do it so we can possibly get in there. Um, People don't like using the word transitional. That's why I would say, hey, we're going to do a transitional attack. Everybody knows that means we're going in the second we knock this thing down because we got to get inside. We got to check the spaces that are, that are there. And again, what I wrote in the chat, chat room, primary search is a rapid, thorough search. It's not clear till it's searched. And sure. that's, you know, saying exterior attack. Okay, that's cool because we're going to do an exterior attack. People have gotten so scared of that word transitional. And it's but it's it's an actual mode of it because it's an again it's an attack to knock down to get inside to do what we got to do to make it to make it our availability to get absolutely, in. John. Yeah, that's yeah, that's absolutely huge. Right. You know, it's it's not clear until we say it clear, and I know that's a cliche, but you know, gosh, if we listen to the reports from the exterior from people, you know, how many times do we see that they were told not that they weren't in there, and we go and make a search because that's what we're there to do and we find victims, right? So yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we, we got to be mindful of what we choose to listen to on, on the reports. All right, go to the next one, Jordan. Yeah. All right, observe. Hey, Sean, can you guys hear Sean? No. No. How's it hey, now? Hey, what kind of internet you got? Is that Audi brand? <laughs> it came from a Cracker Jack box, bro. Bro, that's, <laughs> bro, that's that Cricket Wireless, bro. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Buddy, you work, oh, for city of, you work for the city of Venice. You could afford something else, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that, it's that junkie Fidos is what it is. <laughs> Um, all right. Can you guys hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So th this observable condition from the exterior, you know, this is a, a, a T5 system thing and it makes so much sense. What does this mean to any of you guys, right? When you show up and you see this and, and you observe it, right? Is, is this what's going to base your actions for the entire fire or is that just a snapshot in time? Right. To me, when we observe, something from the exterior that that's a I call it a 1d view right you're, you're looking at something from the outside but what we have on the outside may not actually be what's occurring on the inside right so the only way to really truly know what the interior is like is to go inside right so that gives you your 3d view so I always tell everybody if you give me the chance to, to look in like a one dimension or a three dimension I'm gonna choose a three dimension once you play, break that plane of the box, which is essentially the house, four walls, you go in and you start forming walls and things like that. There's furniture in the way. So the layout of that structure is now modified. So I take a view like this and I go, wow, that looks like a heavy volume of fire. Sure. It looks like a heavy volume of fire. It doesn't mean that it is, right? We talk about closed doors and all those other things that, that mean something to our victims and their survivable rates. When you, took a, when you take a snapshot like one that's in this picture and you choose to write it off, we're truly missing the mark there, right? So we, we want to make sure that we base our actions on a core foundation of knowledge that we have that's going to guide us in the right areas, you know, because let's just face it, none of us here are smart enough to risk our life or anyone else's life based off our opinion, right? We need to know the facts. And, you know, unfortunately, things like this, you got to step that up a little bit and, and make an effort to find out what those facts are. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And just real quick to touch on that, that goes, you, everything ties together. That goes back on making decisions based off of fear. Whether, <clears throat> whether you make a decision based off of adrenaline, that's bad. And if you make a decision based off of fear, that's bad. We need to make decisions based off of tactical knowledge. That's right. Yeah, I agree. Because, right, we talked about it. everything's searchable at some point, isn't it? Right. Absolutely, bro. So we need to be intelligently aggressive, right? We, we don't want to just be acting off pure emotion. All right. So. Next one. Yep. Try and keep it moving for everybody. Yep. Size up considerations. This is, this is a big one for me, right? If you guys notice, bag the fire. Some people know what that means. Some people don't. So when you're looking at your fire, you need to know where it's been, where it's at, and where you project it to go. That's your bag the fire, right? So if we take those few seconds, we're going to save a ton of time, right? And really, the whole reason why we want to bag the fire is we need to understand if we choose to make our search from the front door, we hug like every square corner of this house we're doing a tremendous disservice right mm -hmm. we're not we're not operating as effectively as we could for them and it wastes valuable time right we're, we're just you know we need to understand that today in our modern fire service fire growth is measured in seconds not minutes that stuff is quick you know whatever we put in our house all that stuff so you really don't have time to be going through these spaces all like lackadaisically like you know and, and like slow you, you got to move with a purpose. You got to identify that quick and you got to get in there and get it done. Because if you don't, uh, I'll show you the slide of what this house looks like if you chose not to. But one big thing that, that we look at is I'm not a big blue card fan. Okay. So I apologize if I offend anybody with this. I do like the term can report. Okay. I think that is huge, especially when it comes to diving in windows or making searches and stuff, because we need to know our conditions. We need to know what those conditions mean because those guide our actions. And then once we're inside doing stuff, we need to know what our needs are. So if we decide to look in that window there where that AC unit is and we dive in there, we might want to consider what? Our need might be suppression. We might need water to support our search effort, right? All these things need to, to come into play when we're doing this and we need to be quick. Right? And that only comes from proper training and knowledge and, and implementing these things get it. We don't go to a lot of fires. Some of us do, some of us don't, but that doesn't mean we can't train and we can't train our minds to be thinking about this stuff. John, Pablo, Chris, Jordan. No, man. Uh, I, I'm with you. I like blue card. Uh, I like blue cards terminology on so like a can report. And, and I think it keeps the fire ground a little more organized, especially for my situation with our staffing it's just uh it's trying to get other organizations to hop on board you know we talked about terminology sean is struggling tonight man <laughs> no I, I just i just turned my camera off that's all yeah uh, yeah we heard it <laughs> <laughs> We talked about terminology and and mutual aid coming in the city or coming into your your run district or you're going to them you know, they might have a totally different vocabulary than what we do. And you got to find that happy medium of what they're talking about and what you're talking about. And it's, uh, it I all comes that, back to training and just having a, uh, an adult conversation with people. Uh, right. I think you're right. It comes down to training, comes down to cross training going and with your, with your mutual aid. The other aspect is knowing what your, what your instant commanders are going to be asking for from your officers. You know, the IC is going to give you, Hey, give me a can report. All right, so your officers should understand what that is, mm -hmm. right? Because we all have to be on that same, same level playing field. We don't yeah. use blue card on the East Coast, at least in my city. We don't use a blue card. We use, you know, the NIMS, National Incident Management, from the ICS, all that other crazy stuff, you know, the alphabet soup. But there's certain acronyms that are out there that are standard to the fire service. CAN is probably one that made it from, from the West Coast to the East. Yeah. And uh, everybody's grabbing it besides the uh, two and a half gallons of pressurized water. And I think, I think the can report is keeps it simple and it's just easy to remember in your mind. And, but the biggest thing though, only one person in that group is talking on the radio. Not, not every, that's the one thing I think in, in my fire service, 
we're, we're bad at is if you have groups or, or specific functions working inside and we say uh, interior from command, and then you've got every functioning group inside that's interior, you know, they're doing different jobs, a search, fire, attack, overhaul, whatever it might be. You know, you need to organize who you want to talk on the radio. Typically, it's the lieutenant that's in there or the, the next most senior guy of that group on the radio. But not everybody's on the radio at once. That that stuff, I know it drives a lot of us crazy. Absolutely. Well, that's how you miss a May Day, honestly. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's that's the biggest thing is, okay, we know what our jobs are. We're going to get in. And you should really only be talking on the radio when you need something. Mm-hmm. You know, and we, we, try to, we tend to take up a lot of radio traffic with stuff that means nothing, like saying ums and ahs and like at this time and all this stuff that we say that you know, we don't really be advised. Be saying, so. What's be advised, my assignment? Yeah. Uh, yeah, two minutes yeah, exactly. out, what's my assignment? I don't know, man. What, what are you second, third, fourth through, fifth through, tenth through? Are you, you know, I don't, right. I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah I've literally, I've heard, I've literally heard people on tankers ask, Hey, what's my assignment? Uh, oh, you're on a tanker. What do you, what do you, what do you think your assignment is? No, <laughs> yeah. Water <laughs> supply. So, all right, let's, uh, we'll keep it moving. So we don't get too, too far off yeah, track. Uh, just, just to clarify, a CAN report is conditions, actions, needs. That's what that stands for. Yeah, Jordan, if you see any questions, like they're not popping up for me. So I, okay. I keep trying to scroll back. So if you see anything that I need to address, please let me know so I yep. don't get too far ahead of myself. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, Chris. Uh, Chris, talk about clues real quick. Yeah, I well, since Joey's not here, I'll, I'll try to speak on behalf of him. But Joey, um, is my uh, mentor. Um, he's taken me under his wing now for the past, you know, four years, and I, uh, I'm truly humble and blessed, and I've been able to also um, kind of fall under the wing of Andy too a little bit. Um, he's been uh, throwing me some information here that um, that's been awesome because I've been trying to uh, develop, you know, a, a TIC class um, on my own. Joey, uh, Joey's trying to take. Uh, more of a backseat now as he's reaching towards the latter part of his career and just kind of wants to settle down a little bit. So um, Joey's got a great, you know, acronym that I, that I use myself, um, you know, clues, condition, location, utilities, exposures, and survivable spaces. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. It's, it beats the coal as well. Um, and, you know, all those other progress report acronyms that are in, uh, that are in that massive uh, tactics book that I had to read for my officer's exam uh, as of late. But um, yeah, it, it, if, if you're able, if you're ever able to take Joey's class, um, it, it's definitely a phenomenal one. I won't dive too much into it, uh, but yeah, it's um, it, it makes things easier and it just makes your thought process uh, go a little bit quicker, especially when you're, you know, you're rolling up to something like that um, in that picture right there. So, so, but Joe uses clues for thermal imaging. It's, it's yeah. another great ac- acronym for, for size up too. But again, uh, you know, doing the, the cold was well, so the 15 point size up for command is different than what you're going to be looking at as a, as a company officer rolling up. Um, but again, Joey's, Joey's uh, clues is great for, uh, using it for thermal imaging and where, where things are going. But uh, that's great that you're working with him. Joey's another good friend of uh, yeah. friend of mine. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Chris, can you, can, can you type in the chats uh, what clues the acronym stands for? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And we're just going to yeah. keep chugging along here, guys. Also, if you want, Jordan, at the end of this, like any information that people want, I'll, I'll make a list of and I can send it to you or they can get in touch of either one, any one of us directly. Yes. So we'll make yep. sure they get it. So, all right. So Pablo touched on this and gosh, he, he almost hit the nail right on the head. Aggressive types, right? So the thing with being aggressive is that we have to understand that there's a huge difference between being an aggressive firefighter and being a reckless one, Right. We don't ever want to do anything that's going to endanger ourselves or others just because pride, right? Um, that doesn't get anywhere and it uh, doesn't get any of us anywhere. So a couple of things on the um, aggression types, you have sensible, right? I think it's what we all need to aim for because it, it's managed and it, and it has a purpose. But when we get to, to being reckless, that's when we show up and we like our emotions play into it and we just stop thinking clearly and, and we're just, making poor decisions right irresponsible ones i don't want to throw anybody on the bus but i i have seen an increase in this 
you know, the mentality is, oh, we don't go to fires anymore. So it's not that important to, to know. And, and it really is because when you show up and you're clueless and you're careless, man, my objective at the end of the day is, is to go home and I want you to go home too. And when I have somebody that's calling the shots and they're clueless and careless, that's a problem for me. Right. Um, because then that just leads to the whole irrelevant, you know, part of things you at that point, <laughs> that's just fear driven. You're making decisions. You're pulling people out of buildings. You're not making stretches. You're not doing any of this stuff. You're calling it fully involved when it's not because you truly don't know what to do and you're scared to make a decision. And, you know, I know we've all heard it before about the garbage man at Christmas, you know, it doesn't get scared. So we shouldn't, when we come around the, the uh, corner and we see a fire, but people do. And I don't know if that's lack of training or lack of experience or whatever, but somebody called us for a reason, right? Because, Hey, when you have a problem with, when your power goes out, you call the power company, right? You have a problem in your own house. Maybe you have a plumbing issue. You call a plumber, right? That's why they're there. Well, we're the fire department. We're here for all this stuff. So uh, we, we really need to understand our aggressions and, and channel those in the most appropriate manner for what our situation is. Yeah, there is no 912. We are the 911. <laughs> whether, whether you're paid, semi-paid, partially paid, volunteer, we're all the professionals that we get uh, and we're the ones responsible to handle the issue. Calling a mutual Absolutely. aid to handle your issues is, if you need the help, that's one thing, but having them do it for you is totally different. Right. So that's, that's a good point. How, how many, and I'm going to let anyone talk. You can unmute Mike to do whatever, but how many people in this class have showed up to a fire scene in somebody else's district for mutual aid and nothing's being done and they're kind of looking at you like, oh, thank God you're here. Now go fight the fire, right? Has that happened to anybody? <laughs> John, I hear John chuckling. I hear John chuckling. <laughs> Chris, maybe, yeah, maybe nobody in my wants volunteer you. department. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody, yeah. Yeah. So nobody <laughs> wants to say it, and I and I don't blame for saying it. So I'll say it. I don't care. Um, I have, and and it it pisses me off. It really does because you know it's not my my area. I don't live there but somebody's family does, they live there, you know, that's not our fire, that's their fire, right? And they're hoping that when we show up, we do the right thing. And it just irritates me to no end when you see fire videos online or you show up to these scenes and firefighters who are getting paid, whether it be volunteer, you know, department or not, but you are getting paid by some sort of revenue to be there at that scene to mitigate and handle that emergency and you choose to do nothing. And why did you even show up? Absolutely. Like, that's, that's kind of why I get so angry about it. So. Uh, absolutely. That piss, you know, and, and, and real quick tangent. Uh, I don't, I, I hate, you want to, you want to uh, uh, strike a pet peeve with me. Uh, uh, you, you tell me that it's not my emergency. Uh, shit pisses me off. I get, I get, uh, I get paid or whether I'm a, or I'm a volunteer, doesn't matter. I volunteer my time to be in that person's emergency, or if I get paid, I get paid to be in that person's emergency. So at that point I am going to be a professional about it. I'm not going to be emotionally involved in it. You know, you got to be professional, but it is my emergency. That's what I'm there to help mitigate that emergency. Um, that's one pet peeve of mine. Second pet peeve of mine is, for God's sake, we really got to stop comparing ourselves to, uh, and I'm going to keep this PG, I promised I would. Uh, <laughs> we really got to stop comparing ourselves to, to, to freaking garbage man boys. Uh, I, I am, I'm, I'm not a garbage man, I'm a fireman. And the last I checked, ain't, ain't, no, ain't no bag of garbage that's going to kill a, a, a garbage man. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so excuse me for pulling up and, and seeing something that's heavily involved and, and, and saying, okay, here we go, boys. It's, it's, time to, it's time to get on our game. You know, like compare me to, to, to a police officer. Compare me to, to, uh, to military. But stop comparing ourselves to garbage men. And so, you know, it, it is okay to say, all right, boys, you know, we, we got a job, you know, we got a good run. Let's, you know, let's, let's buckle up for this. And we have to be tactically smart about it. Right. So absolutely little pet peeves about it. I think, okay. I think with, with being tactically smart, it's being good at the basics. Mm -hmm. if, if you're not good at the basics, man, like, you know, I see these classes about advanced forcible entry, advanced fire attack and all this shit. There's no such thing as advanced. It's being really good at, the basis of the job. Yeah. I mean, if the line don't get pulled off right, it's a shit show. If you can't get the door open, 
it's a shit show. You know, everyone funnels to those, those specific tasks that aren't getting complete. And then the snowball effect. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think being, being an aggressive fireman is being really good at the basics. Absolutely. Very much. Absolutely. I I can't agree more. But once you get past the basics, you've got to move past it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw a shameless plug. I got a company called <laughs> beyond the basics, <laughs> but it's, you got to do a little bit more, right? You, yeah. you, you got to know the basics. You got to get them down. I use, I call it muscle memory. Everybody's using it. You got to get that muscle memory so you can do it in your sleep. And then from there you got to perfect and figure out what, what's the next step. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree, John. And, and before we go on the next slide, like, everybody's heard that, you know, was it like a thousand hours or something like 10,000 hours, something that, that it takes to perfect something. That's a long time. Right. So I think that's intimidating to people and that's why they give up on it instead of taking small bites at it and realizing that, Hey man, we have 365 days in a year. If every day you just got 1% better at the end of that year, you would be 365% better than you were when you started. And, and that's really the biggest thing. And, and when that translates into the fire ground, that's a huge issue. You know, we got we to gotta really be doing our best. All right. Does everybody still hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. So what the smoke tells us. Now, this isn't a smoke reading class, and I try and stay clear of, of – you know, turning it into a tactics class. However, this is huge, especially when we're talking about size ups and we're talking about entry points and, and where we need to, to go and make our decisions because the smoke tells us a lot, right? As you can see, size of the fire, location, how well it's burning, you know, the speed, that's back to time. You know, how much time do I have to get in there and make this search before that gets to me, right? Um, and it talks about, you know, or it tells you about, you know, the, the things that, haven't happened yet that most likely will without any intervention, such as flashover, backdraft, vent point ignition, things like that, right? So the biggest thing for me when it looks at smoke, besides the obvious, is I want to know if this box is still absorbing heat, right? Um, Because I'm obviously not going to go and start making my way into something that's dark, thick, black, turbulent, but I very well might make my way into something that's just kind of laminar and hanging out, right? Because that is a a pretty low threat to me in relation to everything else that's going on. So when we talk about smoke reading, just understand that we need to utilize it to make our best tactical decisions. And that's not just for search, but that's also for fire attack. You know, that tells us a tremendous amount of what's occurring inside the building that we may not even be able to see yet. Um, So, that, that, that goes back to the considerable factors. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to touch on what Matt Dillon just put up. Predict the fire event before it happens. Position your people accordingly. It, it's so important to know and predict what's going to happen, what's potentially going to happen. Know what kind of flow it is. Do you have a, you know, a single directional flow coming out or do you have a bidirectional where air's going in and, and smoke's coming out? Are you going to be in that flow path? Are you in the yeah. exhaust, which is very bad, you know? Yeah. So it's important to know what's going to happen. What event are we going to see after this? What will application of water, and, and I'll, I'll take, the, take the line from somebody, water wins. I think it's Kurt. Kurt mm-hmm. used it. Water wins. Absolutely. Water always wins. Application of water before we get to that point is important. Water wins all oh, the time. Huge. You know, I, and I'm glad you touched on um, – on flow paths because that's that's coming up in the next slide so we'll just hit on it anyway we understand those are buoyancy driven right so that means something to us right so what i mean by that is if you have a uh, like hot very hot fire all that stuff's going to be high and going away from the fire right if you have the cool it's going to be down low and it's going to be moving towards the fire right that's where your unidirectional and your bidirectional flow paths come in I think that's huge because the location and severity of the fire in relation to victim location is paramount. You know, that's, that's really what we're after. And if we don't understand all the things that tell us that, then we're going to get ourselves in a really, really bad place when all we were trying to do was remove somebody from that bad place initially. Right. So now again, here we are, the rescuers become victims. 
uh, and we want to try and stay clear of that as much as possible. All right. You want to go to the next one, Jordan? Yeah. Yep. All right. So just just real quick with the flow paths, like here here's a, a slide about it here. Um, understand that our actions at the fire, they're not only the one, they're not the only actions that have an impact on our victims, right? So when we start opening and closing doors uh, or windows deeper into the structure, all that changes flow paths and pressure and, and all that within the structure too. So that can also have an impact on fire behavior and victims. Um, the best thing that you can do when you come in, if you've searched that room, is close that door. You know, we preach that all the time. A lot of our victims are now being uh, found behind closed doors. And there was even uh, an article a couple of years ago that came out where, you know, this couple was was in this house for a significant amount of time. Uh, didn't look like anybody was survivable, but they were in a room behind a closed door. And, hey, they were. So make make an effort that when you bypass something and you search it, close that. It's going to benefit everybody because um, the the flow paths and it affects our survive or the victim survivability, but it also affects our our safety as firefighters. So if we have multiple flow paths, that's going to cause a significant change in our fire behavior. Sean, I want to talk about that real quick. Yeah, um, yeah good. A lot of people have an issue with closing doors. I'm going to tell you right now, I think firemen are scared of the dark and not knowing where they are. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll be profound with that statement. Uh, I think everybody's that way. We don't want to close things that we might not be able to find our way back out to or open back up. Again, that coordinated search. Um, and again, that comes with training, comes with experience. And it's important to know how your, how your crew is going to react to you. Uh, if you're a volunteer, you never know what crew you're going to have. It could, from from call to call. So you don't know if you're going to have that rookie that just got out of uh, fire one or you got the salty fireman that's been around or it's just two of you or whatever it is. You've got to plan and practice for that and know and come up with how you're going to handle those situations. Career side's a little bit different. You've got, you've got a set crew. So you know potentially how that person reacts or acts at that fire or what they're going to do. Some of, uh, some of the best guys I've crawled down a hallway with, I've never had to talk to because he knows what my action is and my, what my reaction is going to be to certain situations. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, and spe especially, uh, I love that you said that, John, because I know you're, 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 you're an officer. That goes back to, from a tailboard standpoint, for, I'm a tailboard, I'm not an officer. From a tailboard standpoint, I need to show up to, to, I want to show up to the firehouse, especially if I don't know my officer or I'm getting to know him or I'm getting to know, know my crew. I want my officer to let me know what his expectations are and we need to talk about it. And I'm going to let him know what my expectations are. We need to be on the same boat before yep. we even get out of the firehouse. Pablo, you're, you're absolutely right. When I get somebody new that's either detailed or on a cover to my, to my truck, I tell them what their, what their tool assignment is and what I expect. And I actually break it down sometimes by building construction type and what, what we've got, what I expect. Different tool packages for different, uh, for different buildings. Mm -hmm. um, it's important. I know what I carry. I carry a halogen and a, uh, my tick. I just changed it. I added a, a fire mole to my, uh, okay. to my tool package. So I can better effectively do forcible entry. I don't have to wait on my my jump seat guy to come up and assist with that, but he's at least has a six foot hook and a uh, striking tool Absolutely. in case it's, it's harder. But again, that tool package changes, uh, depends upon what, what type of building we go to. We go to, we go to a class one high rise. We're going to be bringing uh, heavy iron. So now mm -hmm. he's going to bring a, not just a, not just, he'll bring a sledge and now he's going to start carrying the rabbit tool also. Absolutely. You know, it's, it all depends. And again, having that conversation of expectations of what you want from that person, because if they don't do what you want, it's on you. It's on yeah. the officer for not telling. telling Absolutely. Them what you want. And from a state of Florida standpoint, John, I, I love that you said it. Cause I know that you, you know, you work for, for a heavy ur urbanized area in up in, in the East coast. And from the state of Florida standpoint, from a more rural standpoint, um, Hey, depending on what I'm showing up as first, second or third do completely, completely changes what I'm operating as, you know, so I could literally be operating as, as, as a nozzle man, or I could be, or I could be taking a roof. So, um, you know, that, that definitely understanding, uh, what the officer expects, uh, before you even, before the, before you even go on the first EMS run. Yeah. 
is is a huge is a huge uh, key to success. Absolutely, I I agree with with all of that. You know, and our our engines, our toolboxes, most like you know, just just like every other piece of apparatus we have, right? It's got specific things on it for a specific reason, and we need to know what they are so that when we do get that assignment, we know how to operate. You know, um, so this um, slide that we're looking at now, this is something um, that comes out from Firefighter Rescue Survey. So just, I, I don't need to read it to you, everybody can read, but those numbers right there, those statistics, that just furthers the point that we can't be showing up and just taking people's words for it. You know, and we talked about the numbers of surveys and everything coming out, but think about that. If you look at 27% at this time that, that had no reports at all, to me, that, that's, that's a pretty large amount of number that we're finding victims in areas that somebody said was, was all clear, right? Yeah. And, and so we need to ask ourselves, why is that? Could that be intentional? Absolutely. You know, we got people do all kinds of crazy things. Very well could be. Could it be by accident? Yeah. I'm going to tell you I have two little girls. So if my house catches on fire, my priority is my wife and my daughters. Right? Now, if they had a friend sleeping over, hey, in that, in that moment of panic, I might not be thinking about her friend. So, yes, absolutely. I'm going to say, yep, my wife's here. My two kids are here. Everyone's out. We're good. And then once all that adrenaline and everything calms down, I'm going to do what? I'm going to go, oh, man, she had a friend over. And now I got to go tell the fireman. So a lot of that stuff contributes, I think, to our, our numbers of uh, reports of nobody being inside. I'm going to – I'll throw something out at you. Sometimes the, uh, the police try and do their best to help us out, and they, they do sort of a disservice. I, I a lot of friends are cops, and they do a great job. But they tell you, all right, everybody's out. Mm-hmm. Well, what about the person that ran back in to go get their stash of whatever they needed or their mm-hmm. – I work in a very urban area that's very impoverished. Um, so people have their whole life in that apartment that they have, and they might not be trusting banks. So they keep their cash under their wherever. Right. So people are running back in for their cash, their valuables, sometimes their drugs. Uh, it, it happens. <laughs> but so you get told everybody's out. Hey, you know what? Everybody's shoulders go. <sighs> right that, that uh-huh. you know you're like all right we know we can go do what we got to do we don't have somebody entrapped or whatever else but it's not not clear till we say it's clear and we got to go in and do that primary like we're looking to find a victim andy starn said it to me he goes listen you got to search like you're looking for you're always going to find a victim and Absolutely. that's that stuck with me mm-hmm. i had a uh, i had a small fire in a basement and uh it was just a real light smoke condition. I'm using my thermal imaging camera and I scan and I got, a, I got a person standing in the corner. I'm like, what is that? It's the guy that was trying to put the fire out. He was already outside and ran back in a different door to try and come back and fight the fire after I was told everybody's out. Yeah. And then I found, I found the silhouette. Then I grabbed the guy because he wanted to go back out that other door. And he went back <laughs> in the way that we went. But that's besides the point. No, no, that's that's good that you add that because I think we run into that quite a bit. You know, I mean, that's someone's that's someone's life burning. You know, of course, I think it's all human nature to want to try and prevent that from getting any worse. So that's that's definitely something that we need to be considering. So one thing that we talked pretty heavy about last night uh, when uh, me, Pablo, and Sean and Chris were talking is the words "all clear." Uh, you know, the words "all clear." I have noticed has multiple definitions, all clear from a search, all clear. There's no uh, LELs in the, in the building, all clear on a fire alarm. There's no smoke or anything in the building, all clear. Hey, there's no fire extension. I think that's a bad thing to have a multiple definitions of that phrase. Um, You have to decide what that specifically means. Because I could say all clear on this call, and then I say all clear on the next call, but it has two different words, two different meanings. It kind of creates some confusion. Um, so I think as an organization, that's something that that terminology has to be consistent on every call, and God forbid every shift, which I know will probably never happen. But you know, three shifts, three fire departments. You know, but uh, you have to really work on that. And that's that officer expectations that that 
dictates if something's going to stick or not. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that 100%. All right, so moving on to yes. the next one. Yes, sir. No, don't have to yell at me. Hey, whoa. You watch your tone, young man. <laughs> All right. Um, go ahead and change that slide there, Jordan, to the – there we go. So is everybody – from? yeah, thank you. Is everybody familiar with this grab here? Nope, not that one. Go back one, please. The St. Louis job? There we go. Yep. Yeah. So Pablo's familiar with it. This is, this is uh, 2019 in St. Louis. Now, this is a perfect example of why we can't believe what people say. Um, they found four kids in this fire. Four, okay? To me, that, that's, that's just crazy. And mom wasn't there, right? She, she wasn't there, but that, this fire was reported to have nobody inside, and they show up, but they do. Right? They go in, they found, uh, they found one in a closet. I think two were in a play tent. Um, and there was one, like, standing in the doorway. And it's, it's crazy because these kids were all under the age of four years old. So think about that for a moment. They have no direction, no guidance. They don't, they don't even have the ability to call for help if something was to happen. So here they are in there. And if you look at each one of these pictures, you look over there in the top right, this firefighter is giving that little girl ventilations, right? So that tells you what? We don't have much time, right? The longer they're in there, the worse it is for them. What so are you doing? Whoa. What? Who was that? Stand by. We're good. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> <kind of> awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Uh, what that means is like when we, when we read the UL studies and stuff like that, they talk about exposure duration um, and everything like that, right? That the longer we're exposed to it, the worse it is for us. But it, it also talks about um, what we're being exposed to. So you can have an exposure for a short amount, short amount of time and still have a fatal outcome. Or you can be exposed for a fairly large amount of time and still have a fatal outcome. So um, that, that really means for us as searchers, we can't be showing up and be like, there's no way somebody's alive in there. It's just not possible. Because every situation is dictated differently. So, Hey, before, before we move on, I want to ask this question. What, what is a credible source of information on a fire scene? You pull up my kids in there or the neighbors saying they have three kids in that house. What do you guys consider to be credible sources as a first due officer? Uh, me as the searcher, the fire crew, that's my credible source. I don't listen to police officers. I don't listen to bystanders. Um, I know what they say and I move on because I still have a job to do and I'm not going to let what they say stop me. And I don't care if they say, look, everyone's here. Great. I still don't know that. Right. I, if I take what you say and I go, great, and I slow myself down, and then on the um, secondary search or maybe do an overhaul, I find two kids or, you know, somebody different, you know, maybe maybe it's a, a mom or somebody. I'm going to take that hard. I'm going to take that a lot harder because I slowed myself down. I put it in my mind that, okay, my level of importance of where I decide to do things got dropped because of what this person said. All right. Um, that's just my opinion. You know, somebody else might be different, but I, I think that we are the ones that need to make the determination whether that building is all clear or not. Well, if I, if I may, if I may, I have, I have something real quick and, and it's an analogy, right? So let's say you're taking the biggest test of your life. All right. So you are taking something that you, you, you have been wanting to achieve for a long, long time. And I came up to you and I don't know you. And I said, I said, Jordan, John, Sean, whoever, I'll be like, Hey guys, I ha and I don't know you. I have the answers to your test. Here's your test. You, you have them. You have, they're legit. They're the real answers. You know, I'm not trying I'm not trying to mess with you. They're the real answers. Do you take my information? Do you take it or do you do your own? Do you still do your own research? Right. The analogy goes to, to the fire ground. I'm going to I'm going to take this information that the, that the, that the, that the homeowner, the, the police officer, whatever is giving me. I'm going to note it. I'm going to I'm going to understand it. I'm not going to just discard it. It's going to be I'm, I'm going to take it. But I still have to do my own research, which is then turns into we're still going to search. Right. So that's kind of the answer that I got. Pablo, I, I just want to jump in again. Let's go back to fire one. What's a primary search? Rapid, thorough search looking for fire and life. 
So we got to get in there and find the fire anyway. Might as well search for the people while we're doing it. Correct? Absolutely. 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 100, yeah, 100%. So yes. whether, whether, like you said before, if you don't have an engine, if you don't have a truck company, somebody still has to do a search. Mm-hmm. They got to do a primary. And the primary has mm-hmm. got to be done looking for both fire and life. Absolutely. And it can John, be done at the same time. Yeah, go ahead. I, th- I think you're reading my mind, bud. That's a great point, yeah, man. That, you're, yeah, that's you're beautiful, on point. John. Yeah. Because um, when, when we switch to this next slide here, you're going to see a lot of what you just said. And I want everybody to see it because you don't have to stop talking, but it, it all makes sense of, you know, going in to find fire and light. So, yeah. So, uh, so one, last, one last point before we move on. I, I am amazed in 2020, people don't know their neighbors. They don't know anything about their neighbors. If they have kids, you know, any of that stuff. So, you know, for me, it's kind of hard to say, all right, I'm solely basing my tactical decision off of a complete stranger. You know, it's, uh, that's, that's something that you just, like you guys said, and I agree hundred percent, do your own, do, Sean, you raised your hand, bud, <laughs> you know, do, no, I didn't. Do, do your own, uh, assessment, do your own homework for, for your scene. Um, all right. So moving on, we're getting, uh, we're starting to lose some people on this thing, but we're going to keep chugging along. Yeah, absolutely. Are we good on this one? Yeah, we can move on. I want to bring, I want John to finish up his statement while we bring up this next slide because it, it fits so well and, and people can actually physically see the points. There you go, John, go ahead and continue, buddy. So basically as we search and I'm lucky enough to be on a truck company. Our truck company gets out first. That's, uh, that's what we do. We're the pathfinders. All right. The fire service, and you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a tangent to bring it back. The fire service is great at stretching our initial line. What are we not good at? Redeploying that initial line. All right. They found that in the slicers and the transitional attack study. We're great at that initial stretch. So if we stretch wrong the first time and not find the seat of the fire, we're not going to get that line in play in between life and fire. So truck company guys are the first due in, whoever, however you make it, you got to find that path to the fire, call it out mm-hmm. and continue your search. If you're able to control that door, close that door, do the sweep inside. You know, if you got a can, Hey, knock it down. Nothing's better than knocking a fire out and not having the engine company guys open that nozzle. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, I, uh, I even sort of, uh, I hedge my bets. I put foam in my water can. I put a, a couple cups of foam in. We shake it up every morning just in case to get that added knockdown and power and uh, that stopping power. But if we can able to knock that down, close, close that door, whatever we got to do and continue to search safely, again, we're not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize us. Remember, risk a lot, save a lot, risk nothing to save nothing. But we got to do that right. And again, and we find out that, what was that? 4.2 percent. Uh, percent are found in the fire room. All right. And you find the seat of the fire 56% of the time. All right. It's important. You got to find the fire, whether it's the, uh, the main fire body of fire, or you're going to find other fires potential from extension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing I'll add about that, John is right. So we're searching for victims, right? That's fine. But the one thing that's the threat to all of us is that fire. So one of the best things that we can do is to start suppressing that fire and get some ventilation going. That's going to be beneficial to everyone. You're, you're absolutely right. It's getting that line, get that line in play. It makes everything better, right? You start reading uh, Norman's uh, fire officer's handbook of strategy and tactics. Hey, fire goes out, things get better. Yeah. I would say almost 90% of the time, right? Probably oh, yeah. a little, probably a little bit more, but you put that fire out, things get better in life. Absolutely. All right, Jordan. Yeah. You got anything to add? Yeah. Nope. Nope. All right. So we just touched on visibility. Why fire attack is hitting the fire, you know, and searching along the way. And and maybe we're waiting on a search crew or maybe we are the search crew. This is paramount. You know, we want to be able to see, right? When we go in and we start searching, most of the time it's lights out, right? We're having to feel things and, and, and make our way through and spread out and, and clear spaces. Imagine how much more effective we can be if we can see, right? So this is just a definition of um, 
what different levels of visibility are. And I think realistically, I, I would like to be somewhere between moderate and high. So we ask ourselves how we do that, right? If we're searching, if any of you have ever done um, any research on the Governor Island study and found out what they found, and it's, it's great. When we search and we go ahead and we isolate ourselves behind that closed door, if we were to go take a window to aid us in ventilation and get that lift so we can do a better search, that has zero relation on the fire because we're isolated from it. So even if we don't have fire attack in play right now, we're fairly okay, right? Now, what does that do? That buys us some time, but it buys our victims time. Because like John touched on, our primary search should be fast. So God forbid you missed somebody the first time. Mm -hmm. At least you left them in a better environment because now you left and you closed the door behind you. They're isolated and all that stuff is exhausting, right? So you're, you're giving them that extra chance that you may not if you just go in, do a quick search and come right back out and you leave the door open or you don't take the window. So Absolutely. just keep in mind. Um, just want to touch on something that's in the chat room. Uh, my buddy, Sean Egan's in here. Yeah, um, yeah that was good. <laughs> Sean's got the, it's Sean does this. He's a, he's a captain up in Buffalo. Uh, it's so important for the engine company to notify companies if they abandon the stretch for a rescue. Cause you know what? There's no water going on the fire unless there's a second line. Mm -hmm. Sean, you know, Sean had a, uh, just had a couple, just had a double fatal fire a couple of weeks ago, and they, their companies were making rescues, and uh, it was it's a crazy video that that was out there on Facebook. But uh, great point, Sean. Thank you. Yeah. All right. You got the next one up there, Jordan. Yep. Hey, Sean, how's it going, buddy? I didn't see you pop in. All right. So this one again. Another fire that I put in there because it is one of those aspects where it can easily distract us from, from what our priority is, right? I would definitely say without a doubt, fire attack is important in this particular situation. The minute we go take a VES and we take this window, that fire is coming right to it because it's uncontrolled. Right? That can have significant ramifications for us. So take a look on the uh, Bravo side, though, in that back corner. There's a, another window back there. That's where our size up on our search comes in. Because if I ask you which one of those windows are you going to pick, which one will you? They're both equally important to, my, to me, right? There's spaces we have to search. But what about staffing levels? What if we're short staffed and we can only get into one of those rooms? Which one are you choosing and why? That's the question we have to answer every single time that we show up and we start doing our tactical priorities. So me personally, and this is just me, like I said, it's not a tactics class, but what I would do is I would have, let's say I ride a two-man engine. I'd have my partner be suppressing that fire while I dumped into one window, cleared that space, came back out and dumped into the other one, okay? That's what I would personally do um, yeah. because it makes sense for what my staffing levels are and what I know my abilities are. Everyone's different, so... I, I threw that in there for that. So is any, if anybody has anything else they want to add in there, please do. Yeah, it goes, it goes back to the adage, can you, can you safely split a crew? Absolutely. You know, can, can we do anchor, uh, uh, oriented man searches? Can we, do, can we do searches off of a hose line? Can we do split searches? Absolutely. We don't need, um, uh, we don't need to continue. We were talking about this last night with, uh, with Jordan for a little bit. We don't need to continue these training scars that we have, right, from from the fire academies, right? We 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 do this to ourselves, whether it be on engine companies, whether it be uh, truck companies, whether it be uh, ambulances, whatever or whatnot. We have training scars that 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 we develop from from the academies, you know, like well, we 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 need to go in and do a right hand search pattern or a left hand search pattern. We need to to have our um, our. Uh, uh, in contact with a wall, we need to be in contact with physical contact with ourselves. Um, uh, from a hose line standpoint, uh, we need to um, uh, always hit the, the the seat of the fire. We can't, you know, we 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 don't cool environments. These are all training scars that we do to ourselves from 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 the academies and uh, from a from a from a VES standpoint. You know, like we got to be careful with the training scar of 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 saying, oh, we need 
two people to VES, you know, like, can we do a split VES? Can, can someone, can, can you do multiple windows? Can you do a VES be, be on the door? Um, understanding that, you, you know, like we're not, it's a 10 by 10 room for the most part, you know, a 10 by 10, a 10, uh, an 11 by 12. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a larger room in most of, in most of these private dwellings, right? So we need to get away from training scars that we con continually, continually do from, from the, from the fire academies that we take on to the fire ground. Absolutely. I think one thing with this building um, or this, this specific picture is what is the building construction? If it's a balloon frame, frame. that's, that is something that I'm worried about because fire can be everywhere uh, in that, in that situation. But you know, it's for me, this is uh if, it, if, if I'm lucky and I have a three man engine, you know, we can do a lot, but if typically I'm just two guys on the engine and then I have a medic following me behind with the driver and the battalion is, is in his car you know, we're going to be uh, forming a group very quickly to get this done. It's, it's all about what have you trained for? Are you on the same page in this scenario? And uh, getting that first line in place. For me, I'll be up front getting the, the line in place first and then splitting off of that to, to do the search. That, that's just my staffing. We got to get it done. So I, I would agree with that, Jordan. I'm going to throw this out there. How many people are knocking that fire down and going through the front door first? How many times are we putting that first line always through the front door? Mm -hmm. Again, the fire service, we don't, those two words, always and never, right? Mm. We yeah. major, what's the majority of the time are we doing? Are we putting that line through the front door or is it better to, or can we get it around from the back and push it out? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree with that's, that. That's part, of, that's part of that 360 and I'll call it the 380 size up. You know, I throw my, uh, throw Ryan Pennington a bone again for, uh, from hoarding and uh, jump seat training that 380 of the cues and clues on the outside, that extra 20%, but getting around the back to figure out if you have a, a quick access point coming from the Delta side to the Charlie to blow that straight out. That's a, that's a textbook fire for me. Blow that right out. That looks like a one room burnout, that uh, living room potentially. Right. That's, but again, large fire, large water. Maybe it depends yeah. on what size hose we're grabbing. Are we grabbing inch and three quarter? Definitely not taking the inch and a half. Maybe bump it up to a two if you uh, you have it. Two mm -hmm. and a halfs are tough because uh, once you get them in place, that's it's tough to move unless you got the manpower. Right. Yeah, I want to touch on what uh, Sean just said too. He made a good point um, that everybody gets distracted by the fire, and that's that's and that that's the truth, right? When we look at this, our eyes naturally want to gravitate towards light. So, boom, whoa, that's a big volume of fire, right? So now we're consumed with that aspect that we lose track of everything else that still needs to happen or that may be happening around us. So um, that, that was a good thing that Sean brought up. So thank you for that, brother. I appreciate it. Jordan, if you want to go to the next one, unless yes. somebody else has Hold anything on. to add. Dane had a question about least tenable window first. So which window would you pick? And it's tough to figure out because right now I'm going to use my thermal imaging camera to scan that A side window, right? What does it say? Right. Thermal imaging camera just can't see through glass, but you can see through the outside, right? You can see around. Is that house 100% um, you know, perfectly sealed? you're going to get heat coming through. You're going to see around the outside. If you don't have heat or anything coming from the outside, guess what? You probably have a closed door. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be honest, just looking at this, um, I don't know. Initially arriving on this, I would say maybe I just have a well-involved, a well-involved porch fire. You know, um, you, you don't know, unfortunately. That's why, that's, the, why that's why that 360 is important and knowing Absolutely. And knowing your jurisdiction, because once you sure. get inside your buildings, like Jordan said, for on your EMS runs, you know the the size up and the layout of this this house. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, like if you look at that first window off to the right, looks like they're good indication that the door's pro probably closed. There's not a whole lot of smoke or anything pushing out, but we can't say that for sure, right? So what I would do on my 360 outs look at that window to the left. If that had any flame impingement on it or was weakened in any kind. Um, that would be my priority window why a fire attack is happening because it's already been compromised. So that means a lot of smoke and heat has already made its way into that space. For me, that's priority. Um, but like I said, everyone's different. Those are all things that come with experience and, and getting out there and, and seeing things firsthand. So. Hey, I, I, I had a question sent to me. Um, it was, uh, could you, uh, 
Could you use a deck gun for a quick hit and send your crew into one of the windows with a line? What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm going to say I, your accuracy, how often do you shoot your deck gun? That's just my point because you're dropping a lot of water real quick. You might put yeah. it right up and over. Uh, a, a good placed line in a transitional mode to put it inside there, reset the room, I think you got a better, better shot with your gallonage, especially if you don't have a water supply. I agree with you. Uh, by the way, uh, John, uh, I agree with you 100% on that. Uh, uh, a little tidbit, and I got this from the uh, boys down in a uh, little plug for the boys in, in Liberty City, um, the Miami-Dade County boys, uh, Bill McCann down there, man, they do a good job of, of just stretching and training every day. Uh, I put, because of them, and I started with them doing first, I put a gate valve on, uh, we run, a, excuse me, we run a gate valve on our deck gun. So it's closed. So when, uh, yep. So when the, when the, when, if we, absolutely it's closed. So when the, when the driver pulls the, the, the lever, nothing comes out unless, until he comes, uh, he goes up the top, points wherever he needs to, and then opens the gate valve. So, uh, and like I said, I took that one. I, I wish I came up with that, man, but I came, I, I saw that one from, uh, Billy McCann down there in uh, Liberty City, man. And damn, that was smart. <laughs> What, new, I love about uh, that, what I love about that, though, is you free up. You don't have to put one of your line guys on top of the engine. You know, you're maximizing your staffing. It's a force multiplier is what uh, Chief uh, Howard Ryanwall always says. Um, but, man, if you got a ram nozzle, mercury, whatever it is, one of those quick throw-down monitors, 500 gallons a minute, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a quick – ours is pre-connected on the back of our truck, so we can pull that off, hit it real quick, and then go – go down on size of line if you need to. Um, it, the biggest thing is have the plays in your playbook and, and be ready for them. But if your officer throws the audible at you, you got to be prepared for the audible as well. Okay. Um, if you don't what have about the, it, what about a two, what about the deuce and a half with a breakaway tip? Yeah. Yeah. yeah another great option. Yeah. You know, then you, then you follow it up with a hundred foot of a uh, dry line. Mm -hmm. And once, once you do that knockdown, I, I did that when I was uh, covering on an engine, we had a we had a fire in a uh, four story ordinary with a large setback. It was on the Bravo Charlie side, blowing out both windows, first floor, auto exposing to the second. And uh, I let off with the two and a half, reset the room, uh, dropped it down, and then uh, we disconnected uh, the stack tip, and yeah. went and mopped it up with the inch and three quarter. Yep, absolutely. But again, you've got to have the tools in the toolbox. Not the physical tools, but the mental tools of doing it. And not just listening to us talk about it today. Get out there and stretch it. See how it works. Yeah. Absolutely. Amen to that, John, because that's what I always tell everybody. Look, be careful who you choose to listen to, right? If I tell you something, I want you to challenge me. I want you to go out there and train on it. And then if you find a deficiency in it, ask me why I feel the way I do because you proved me wrong, right? Um, that is my challenge to everybody. Because if you're not doing those things, then I'm just going to assume that you're, you're just taking it how, how uh, it's meant to be from somebody. And that person may be very inexperienced with what they're saying. And until proven, knowledge is just theory. That's all it is. So you Absolutely. need to be putting that in the application. Um, so we'll move on from that. Uh, closed doors are open opportunities, right? I truly believe this. There's a lot, like I said, teaching on this. There's some levels there. Just look at the oxygen percentage when the doors close. 18%. Well, 21% is like our normal breathable air. 18% when doors close, I think that's pretty good. We, we can manage that, right? But as soon as we open it, that goes all the way to 8%. That can't support life, right? That's, and, and if you're breathing, you won't be breathing for very long. Mm -hmm. So even looking at the to toxic gas levels, you know, we, we just – talked about exposure duration and, and its relation into time. 100 parts per million when the doors close, 10,000 parts per million when it's open. Those are huge numbers. That, that's a big change. So if you go to the next slide, Jordan. Yeah. Hold um, on. Chris just put up a great, a great paragraph basically in the chat. Chris, you just want to talk on that real quick? Uh, yeah. I, well, I, one of the, uh, this is all Andy's information and, and Joey DeVito's information. It's, it's not mine, but it's just something that I've learned through them over time that, um, that we need to start establishing a, a thermal imaging culture. And, you know, it, it, there are expensive cameras out there and, you know, it, not every fire department has the privilege of having one. Um, so you can't 
you can't replace your natural instincts of sizing up a, a building with um, with technology. But when you have that piece of technology, it, it makes your job as an officer so much easier. Um, doing that 360 size up of your building, you're, you're initially off the bat going to be able to find where the fire is located as you're walking around the structure, seeing where that fire is moving to and looking for those uh, survivable tenable spaces. For those of you that haven't um, seen or heard of Andy Starnes, uh, he's got a great um, we uh, webinar on May 11th, Intelligently Aggressive Fireground um, from 7 to 10 p.m. Uh, go on his Facebook page uh, with Insight Fire Training. Um, he's got some great information, um, especially for, for people that, uh, that aren't too versed with thermal imaging cameras or haven't had a lot of hands-on with it. He goes over a lot of great information on the basics, what you need to look for, um, how you can uh, quicken up your search process a lot easier um, when you're gathering layout information um, inside of a zero invisibility environment and also how to tactically um, apply water to a fire in a zero visibility environment. That way you're uh, what, what I like to call is eliminating the colors in a, in a coloring book. And I see John's got his uh, seek thermal there too. I, I carry mine on my gear too. I, I actually just bought one uh, recently, so I'm going to be carrying that with me as well. It's a, it's a great tool, especially it. It's not a uh, what we call a tactical decision making camera. It's a um, you know it, it's more just a general a awareness level of finding you know where your windows, where your doors are, and it, it's great for every firefighter to have. That way, they're they're able, especially in a in the mayday situation, they're able to find uh, tenable space for themselves as well so absolutely chris thank you i was i was wondering when you were going to stop being so quiet back there i like to listen and gather information but you know me <laughs> for all of you that don't know chris he's he's i don't want to say he's the shy one but he's definitely more of the uh, introverted one so i'm working on it i know i know thank you for that i appreciate it no um, feel free to chime in whenever you want man uh, you know every <laughs> everyone's able to um Go to the next slide there, if you don't mind, Jordan. So this is the two rooms side by side, right? Um, this is a, a fire with the door closed. If you look in that, from the outside pers perspective, if we look at that, that building that was just on fire, and then we put this in relation, we could very well have a space that looks like this somewhere inside of that structure. And when we're just writing things off because the fire looks big and it's scary and we don't know what to do because you know, we don't have the information or the lack of experience or whatever the case may be. This is what we're missing. And that's the whole basis behind this class is getting in here and getting things done. Because what if this person didn't have smoke detectors or any ability for early warning? Maybe they don't have any pets that are waking them up because of the sound of fire and smell of smoke or whatever. They're in that room and we're writing it off and we're going in when? Shoot, that could be 10 minutes, right? So it could be 15, it could be 20, depending on your staffing levels or when you choose to prioritize that search. So we need to be making this happen more quickly in our algorithms. Um, and don't be so married to an algorithm either to where you're going literally down that checklist of what to do. You know, use your mind, use your experience, because the reality is if we're going to be telling these people to close their doors, because we're coming for them, then we, we need to stop being hypocrites and we need to actually go look for them, right? Because that is what their expectation is. They've listened to us. So now it's time for us to do our part. Um, just, by, you know. just, by, just by teaching that in, in your fire education to the public, you are creating survivable spaces. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Absolutely. It, yeah, do you guys remember exit drills in the home when they were hitting that really hard? Like have a space that you, you meet, you know, and, and all. nobody practices that ever. Nobody does. And somebody mentioned that in the comments earlier, and I forgot to touch on it, but that is the truth. So now we finally have something that people are listening to and they're practicing it. Let us do our part. If we went through the trouble of studying this and putting it out there saying, well, this is what we need to do, you to do to help us get you out, then we need to get into these spaces and we need to identify them immediately and, and start making this stuff happen. There's no excuse for finding something like this during overhaul. All right. Anybody got anything else to add? All right. So this, here's the key elements to the search, right? The, the thing with those is 
we need to be searching like our life depends on it, right? And, and Pablo touched on this earlier with athletes. When athletes have a game, or maybe it's a fighter or something like that, and, and they're getting prepped up, they study hours and hours and hours of footage because they want to know their opponent. Yet we sit in a firehouse for 24 hours and we can't know our layouts, at least in our first due. We can't understand our building construction. We can't understand fire behavior or smoke behavior. We can't do any of that stuff. But these guys who get paid to play a game do it religiously and they do it well and they win mm -hmm. and we're failing that that's there's no excuse for that okay we are professional we owe it to ourselves that when we're on duty or off duty we really need to be trying to become subject matter experts on things that are going to kill us and things that are going to kill them because if you're not doing that then you're just getting a paycheck if you're just getting a paycheck then you could just find a different job you know there's plenty of good paying jobs out there you don't need to be here if you don't want to do what you want to do so, um, anybody else? No, bro, that's, that's a Knowledge. true story, bro. I couldn't agree more. So the, the big thing is like people's lives aren't a game. Right. And, and I just, man, it just irritates me to no end because no, we do I, stuff like this. Uh, real, real quick shot. No. And, and the, the, I, I've always said this, man, we, we, as firemen, we, we sell ourselves, we sell ourselves bullshit. And for whatever reason, we, we buy the bullshit that we sell ourselves. Uh, we, don't, we don't recognize it as bullshit. You know, we, 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 tell, we, we, we think for whatever reason we're going we're gonna to come out of minimum standards and uh, you got a nice fancy T-shirt on and we're going to sit on a recliner. And one day after, you know, maybe a year, maybe two years, maybe a handful of months, depending on, on, on who you work for, you're going to wake up one day and, and you're going to do a – a search of a house or you're going to, you're going to throw a ladder or a second, a second floor or a third floor and do a victim removal. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's not, that's not going to work. You know, it, it is what it is. It's not going to work. So yeah. we, we sell ourselves that bullshit and we buy it. Uh, so we need to, we need to physically and mentally be prepared uh, by training like professional athletes, you know, like, uh, like, so anyway, so just, yeah, no, so, I mean, you're absolutely soapbox. right. Your minimal standards leads to minimal results. Yeah, you know, that that's that's just it right there. You know, if that's where your training stops, because you got your nice fancy piece of paper, and you got your job, congratulations. But don't expect anything else, yeah. right? And and you're rat really robbing the citizens because they are putting their trust in you. And when you cry that you need a pay raise because your job is so important, or we're in times like we are now where oh I'm essential, my job's essential. Well then you better be damn essential, right? Yeah. And when you do stuff like this and you search on your hands and knees like this and you do bare minimum stuff then i'm sorry you're not essential because you're not doing any good yeah. right well i think and we talked about it last night accidental success yeah absolutely yeah. we got lucky on this one or you know the the fire went out with the 95 gallon per minute automatic nozzle for 15 years you know we got away with these things for so so long we haven't learned and adapted and we just we haven't gotten caught with our pants down yet. That absolutely yes, yeah. being yeah. lucky creates complacency. I love so, to hear the I love to hear the whole fire went out thing. Hey, just just a random thought. <laughs> the twin towers would have already gone out by this time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. eventually everything goes out well, by itself, boys. Yeah. 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 Uh, all, and, fire, all fires go out, but you're absolutely right. You talked about complacency. Uh, I'm going to throw out a phrase called normalization of deviance. Oh, uh, great video. <laughs> a, good, a good friend of ours, yeah. uh, John Dixon, uh, is a captain up by me in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, does a whole class on normalization of deviance. All right? Again, because we got lucky one time and nothing bad happened, yeah. we're going to continue to do it until it catches up with us. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's, that's a, a great point there, John, because – if you look at this video, or I'm sorry, this picture, mm -hmm. that's me and Pablo, right? Back when we, we worked together and we were fortunate enough to be on the same shift at the same station, we would do stuff like this all the time. And if you look closely, that's baby powder on the, on the floor. And the reason we did this is to show how ineffective the search actually is because if you look, yeah, his head might be up and he might be searching that countertop, but he's not going to be able to keep his head up like that for very long because it's uncomfortable and it hurts. And my head is down. And I'm literally searching the same three feet he is right behind him in this, this Congo line of bodies, right? So we put this victim here to show what are we most likely to do? Keep yeah. your hand on the wall because that's what we're told to do. Don't ever lose that wall. And then my other hand's on the tool. 
I'm not really focused on swinging that tool and trying to find stuff because I'm, I'm literally just moving with him. And if he's hauling ass through that, that now I'm trying to play catch up with him. Right. And I'm not searching anything at this point. So if you go to the next slide, just one sec, take a look at the Halligan position. Um, you'll never know if there's a step or a drop. Absolutely. Take, that, take that Halligan, flip it over on the, uh, on the ads and the pike. And as you, as you're sweeping potentially, or you put it on your inside arm, you put on the inside. If you're doing that right hand search, bump yourself out off that wall and use your own hand. What does the end Absolutely. of a Halligan? What does the end of a Halligan know if it comes in, in touch with something soft or a person? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Bump yourself that, out and bump the other person out. Split search the room. Even better, you have that third person with a thermal imaging camera sitting as an right. oriented search and, and talking to your guys. It's one of the yeah. things that what we said before. Darkness is scary for firemen. We don't like absolutely. it. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. So we can overcome that by speaking and guidance. So, You're so, going to come across this. You're going to see this. And yeah. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead or not. But no, 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 no you're, you're good. You're good. You're, you're good, man. And 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 going back to that right there. The reason we the, the Sean and I put this these particular slides in right here is uh, and I and I said it a little earlier is we're going back to the training scars. When, when you sell yourself bullshit and you're like, oh, well, well yeah, whatever, I'll, 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 I'll rise up to the occasion whenever I have to search or whatever, and, but you don't challenge yourself, you don't train, you don't go outside of your comfort zone, you fall back to your training scar. And what is the training scar? You're going, back to, you're going back to this stuff. You're going back to your searching off of fear, you're not tactically searching. Um, I love what uh, uh, Sean, I was looking at what Sean Egan said here about getting away from searching with a tool. Uh, it, the, the truth of the matter is, yeah, me personally, when I, when, when we do our oriented search, um, I don't search with a tool. When I get to that, when I get to my, to, to my room that I'm searching, um, I'm giving, I'm putting my tool at the, uh, at the doorway mm -hmm. and, and that anchor man, that orient man sits at that doorway with his, with now with, with his tool, with the, with the tick or whatnot. And I'm, and I'm freehand searching that area. Um, at the end of the day, you gotta, you know, you gotta know what you're searching. It's a 10 by 10 room. It's a 10 by 11, uh, 11 by 12, you know, so, um, couldn't agree more with what Sean Egan said there. And, you know, like that picture right there is literally what happens. You fall back to your training scars right there. You do. And, you know, I don't know if anybody is paying attention to it there, but, um, if you see what happens, Pablo and I actually switched. We switched spots. So now I'm in front and he's behind me. We got to the door, we swept outside and we do what they tell you to do. All right, switch searchers. That's a topic for another day. I'm going to say that I, I personally feel like that's ineffective because now you're exhausting all of your resources instead of Absolutely. keeping one person fresh yeah. and focused on orientation. Absolutely. However, what we did do is we completely passed that victim. And what are we going to do if we find this victim? let's say we go with Jordan's analogy. We, we got lucky. We found them by accident in our minds because of how we're trained to do things in the fire Academy, a minimal standard. We are going to grab this victim and we're going to go back out the exact way that's we came the, because that's yeah, all we know. The same yep. way we came in. So in an effort to tell us that keeping our hand on the wall is, a, is supposed to keep our orientation in case you find a window or a door. We're not doing that. Are we, we're going to find this person and we're going to turn right back around and go right right through that IDLH atmosphere that we just crawled through and that's how we're removing them. So that's doing nobody any good and it's painfully slow, right? We have to get better at, at being professionals and moving through these spaces in a manner that makes sense and that's effective. Yeah. So if we're doing, if we're doing VES and, and we teach it a, a, across the country, when I mean we, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about uh, us here. I'm talking about the entire country teaches VES and we preach VES, which is, we're search it's a it's a it's a way of searching rooms that are blocked off by fire. And you go in there and you isolate, right? We know how to we know how to VES. So my question for for the sixty plus people that are watching for us right now is why are we not teaching the same thing from the interior? We go back to the training scar. The training scar is when we find the victim, we go we go back out the same way we we, we came in, the long way. Isolate yourself from the interior, reverse VES. You find you find the victim in, in inside that room. You turn back to your you, you turn back to your partner. Your partner's the one that's that that's sitting at uh, uh, being your orient man. You turn back to him. You know, hey Sean, I got myself a victim. Sean radios in, closes the door behind me. 
Now we're in that room. Now we re reversed BES each other into that room. We bought ourselves time to get that victim out that window, you know, call ourselves, call uh, command, tell them where we're at, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. And uh, just, just one thing before we move on, and unless somebody has anything else, is the whole reason, if you look at the question at the top, why are we taught this? The fire service has a, a horrible habit of letting things go, right? We develop a way to do things, and that, oh, man, that's just got to be the way it is, right? And don't you ever challenge that, because if you do, it's going to be problems. And, and we need to understand that assessing the way we do things isn't always bad. If we're talking about progression, when we change things, we're implying that it no longer works, right? Like, hey, this isn't working. We need to change it. But when we're progressing on something, that progression is saying, hey, you know what? This works, but it could be better. And in this particular situation for this, we've progressed past that into other ways of searching because this particular way was meant for when they didn't have air packs and the cooler, fresher air was closer to the floor for not only us, but our victims. Okay. And that's why that search came in, into play, right? This still has a place on our fire ground. Yeah. It, it's when it's really, really hot and you got to haul ass and get out of there. Okay. That's a good way to do it. However, you run the risk of falling into a hole because your body is off center. So there are pluses and minuses, but when we're talking about victims and how we need to find them, we need to change our stances and we need to be getting, getting better at learning how to do that instead of do this. Absolutely. And uh, if you decide to do this uh, as a training, you're going to need a lot of bottles of uh, baby powder and you're going to get a weird look from the chick from Dollar General. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will. Yeah, you will. Um, all right. So we've been, we've been at it for like two hours now. Do you want to, you want to keep going? Yeah, man. All right, let's do it. If, if you guys, if anyone's got to bounce, you know, feel free to, to take off. I, I totally understand. Yeah. Well, you're recording this so they can come back and watch it later, right? Yeah. Yep. All right, cool. All right. So we'll just finish. We'll keep it going. Yeah. Um, all of us are long winded and we're passionate and I, and I love it. So this is, this is great. Uh, so this got, is, yeah, we still got about 60 people online with us. So. Yeah. I'm, awesome. I'm kind of shocked. Awesome. Honest, well, for that, thank you. You know, yeah, thank you. Um, so this is the triangle position. If you notice, you know, in between John talked about taking a can with you and he puts foam and stuff in it and, and all those things to help him with his, his effectiveness. This is going to help you with your effectiveness. If you carry the can this way while you're searching, not only the stance, but you don't have to hold on to it. So you free up that hand, right? Why are we doing this versus crawling? Your body position is more stable. You can look up and around. You can reach out. You can sound the floor in front of you. If you happen to fall, you know, find a hole, you can lean backwards instead of falling forward into it. But really for me, aside from like the stability of it and everything else and, and the ease of motion that you can get, I want to feel changes in my environment. And guess what? When I'm down at the floor and the fire's above me and I'm three feet from the floor and now I'm just realizing, oh man, it's really, really hot. Things are getting bad. It's already too late. I'm in a bad way where if I upright myself into a tripod position like this and I'm moving through, I will immediately feel that change, right? Because half of me is still what below that and it's going to hit my ears first. And those are super sensitive, even behind a Nomex. So, um, as soon as you feel that, that's your first indication. You're, you're, you're starting to get pushed down. Maybe we need some, some water application and some ventilation to make this better because this is not a good spot. You will not realize that until it is way too late. If you stay on your hands and knees, I promise. Um, does anybody have anything to add other than we have to use the techniques that our conditions allow us to use, right? So understanding that although we have preferences, um, so that's what they are, their preferences. And we have to be mobile and be able to switch those preferences dictated upon our situations we're presented with. Pablo, anybody? No, no, no I'm just listening on that one. That was good. That, okay. uh, uh, that position's uh, easier for uh, tick scans as well. Absolutely, yep. Um, yeah. You're able, and again, I think, the, like we, we said, uh, firefighters are moths to a flame. We want to go always shoot high and see see what's going on above us. Well, it's important to know what, where's our victims? Our victims aren't floating. So by scanning low, we're staying in hopefully high sensitivity mode a little bit longer yep. so we can see the victim, the better resolution. Yeah. Um, if here, for, and I don't know if we have anybody listening that, that operates on, uh, on, ambulance, on ambulances that are fire-based, um, but if you are an ambulance fire-based uh, organization, 
and um, and you do have the possibility of showing up first due, um, and and you believe in 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 what we're preaching, and and that it's not empty until we say it's empty or vacant until we say it's vacant, uh, and you are gonna do a search without an engine crew or without any type of hose line. Uh, take a water can, obviously, and uh, like I t I typed there on the on the chat there. One of the many reasons that I personally wear a truck belt is um, uh, it's just I do I, I will put a, the can on the truck on the on the belt itself and I'll drag I'll drag the can around like that. So if I'm if I'm ever doing a uh, any type of search off the uh, whether whether I'm assigned as the uh, as a truck company or the or the ambulance crew, if I'm doing a search without a hose line, uh, I am taking my can with me and um, I am searching like that. Oh yeah, and Pablo, I got that video um, of that trailer fire doing a VES with the can that we can put in here and send everybody else to. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we're talking about the tripod stance, right? And we're talking about searching. So what happens when we find our victims? The first step in removing our victims is to actually locate them, right? So now we've done that, we found them. If you take a look, this is my captain, my old captain. Um, he's obviously a lot bigger than me. I'm a, I'm a small guy, you know? Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not gonna have to move him. What if he went down in a fire? Or what if that's my victim, you know? We have to understand that us as rescuers, or excuse me, rescuers, we don't get to choose our victims any more than those victims get to choose their rescuers. So if we're showing it in there, like we're coming in and we find them and we don't know how to move them, that's great, you found somebody, but you can't remove them. So they're still just as good as dead, right? It's, it's very imperative that we know how to use our body mechanics and that we're in shape and we can move it. In gear, my captain was about 300 pounds. Okay. So taking this, this tripod stance just further solidifies why it's so important because it's stable. So if you see, I grabbed him by the legs, I did a leg lock with his ankles and I pulled backwards to capture his weight behind my shoulder. Now go ahead and go to the next one, Jordan. So here it is now I'm moving him right to the direction of my exit, which could be a door a window, something like that, whatever it happens to be. But I'm spread out. So now I've taken his weight plus mine and I've spread it out over a larger surface, which allows me to manage him easily. Now, what I will say about this is you have to understand where your limitations are. If I ask you what is the largest patient you can move by yourself right now, I would hope you would know. And if you don't know, please find out because that is going to tell you a lot. If I pull up to some, or if I find somebody like this and I'm trying to remove them and I don't know that I can at least move 300 pounds by myself, when do I know when to call for help? I don't. And when we're talking about splitting crews on a split search or maybe limited staffing, I might not always have the ability to rely on my partner to get this removal process started. So now we're just sitting ducks. So understanding how to move weight and how much weight you can move before you definitely know you need somebody is huge. And staying away from the tricks and gimmicks of wrapping people up and stuff that you're probably not going to be able to see. And it's going to take a long time to get that, that person packaged to remove them. Um, one more, Jordan. Yep. Also, practice it on real-life carpet, not just on the yeah. station floor, yeah. Yeah. linoleum, or anything else. Get that, get that long 1960s, 70s shag rug. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Because you're going to definitely get some friction there. Absolutely. Yeah, and if you guys go to the Build Your Culture Facebook page, there's actually a video of us doing this in training in a carpeted room for that very reason to show you that, man, anybody can look like an expert on a smooth surface. Yep. Right. right. So put those challenges in there that actually halt you and make you work and you'll see what works and what doesn't. And I can tell you, that our students have come back and said that this works tremendously. And like, I, I love it on whatever like surface that I'm on. It, yeah. It's a huge advantage, especially if you're a smaller framed person. So um, here we have it where we're simulating a window, right? You put his toes at the, at the, um, the, the base of the window and then you scoot his ass to the heels. Uh, and then you start rolling him. If you go one more, Jordan. Yes. So that's pretty effortless. That is actually a snapshot just as I started moving him. 
when you get them into a seated position like that, it is literally just pushing. And I've done this on Pablo. I actually showed Pablo how, how to do this particular technique. And so he can vouch for it that it is almost effortless, especially with a large person because their weight works in your advantage. And just like anything we do in the fire service, we need to capture our progress. So at this point, as I'm pushing him, you'd want to actually slide your leg underneath in case they did slide down. You don't have to lose everything. Um, one more. Is that it? All right. So I forgot to put the other one in. The other one was just him pretty much upright, yeah. but I was still on the ground. Um, so it was easy for me just to finish that. So if I have my, my partner on the outside of that window, that whole removal process took me about 30 seconds, if that, by myself, right? So that that's, to me, that's something worth knowing. Um, so anybody got something to add? No, uh, just real quick, real, real quick uh, on that. These are all techniques that, that, are, that, that are used for large individuals, right? Um, obviously we're not, I think it's obvious to say that if, you know, if I'm doing a search and I come and I come across, um, you know, an 85 year old, that's, you know, that's bedridden and weighs 92 pounds and I'm, you know, and I, and I have to do some type of leg lock to get, you know, to get them out. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I need to reevaluate what I'm doing. Right. So this is stuff that, you know, when we come across individuals that are like, Oh man, this is a little bit heavier set person or, or, um, they're heavier set and, and they're naked, they're burnt. They're diaphoretic, whatever the hell, you know, like they're wet. Uh, these are techniques to, to, to help you get that type of larger individual out, you know, so uh, just keep that in mind. Just one of the other things. If they're on the bed, don't pull them off the bed. Grab the sheets. Makes Thank it a lot you. easier. Absolutely. You're not, you know, you're able to package that up. We've, we've all done that for EMS, right? Absolutely. Pick up the patient in the sheet. So much easier to drag or grab or carry. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you adding that in there, John, because a lot of people, their first instinct is dump them off, mm -hmm. right? Um, you got to use everything to your advantage. You know, if they don't have clothes on, you got to know how to move that patient too. So one of the good things to do that in your training would be to lather your, your training dummy up with like some of that um, innovation lubrication jelly or something like that. Make them really slippery because that's going to change. <laughs> you, know? um, yeah. you can't always rely on having their clothes or, or a sheet or blanket or any of that stuff to, to grab. So absolutely, uh, knowing all your options. Just think about how you sleep. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So VES, this is uh, not my saying. This is <laughs> this actually came from Brian Brush. Um, he's got an awesome article on this in uh, Firefighter Nation. It's really, really good. But essentially, when we talk about VES, who remembers these top finders? I know when I was a kid, I remember them but uh, they kind of phase themselves out. Uh, John, do you remember these when you started in the fire service? Absolutely. Then they yeah. became uh, an issue. Right. Uh, there, was an in, there was a push to put them on the inside of the doors now. Of yes, the, there uh, is. Yep. So, and they changed the logo. Yes. You know, so you remember why that was an issue, don't you? Yeah, pedophiles. Right, pedophiles and people moving, right? So, right, and they left them on there, and their 20-year-old kid there. moved out. Yeah, exactly. So the reason I put this in with the VES is because back before we were assigning names to the things we did, this was pretty much your indication to say, hey, VES, this room, right? There's a, there's a child in here and, and things like that. So this was a, a great tool for us, but it proved to, to maybe not be so effective as time went on because of the changes, you know, people like not, not taking them down when they moved. Maybe they moved bedrooms, whatever the case was, uh, obviously the pedophile issues. So we don't see a whole lot of these anymore, but I'm big on making sure that people stay up on fire service history. Uh, so there you go, a little nugget in case you didn't know. Um, go ahead and, and move on. If you would hey, real quick, Sean, uh, just on, a, on talking about nuggets, because uh, the VES slide is on there, and I was talking about uh, uh, the cans and, and the searches. Uh, Chris, I appreciate you putting it on the, on the chat there. Uh, I would hate myself if I, if I didn't mention it. Man, for whoever doesn't know out there, if you guys ever get a chance to take uh, the Can Confidence course um, from Eric Wheaton and them boys, um, Jesus, man, that's probably one of the best courses in the country. So uh, It, is. Uh, it, it definitely will, was one of the best classes I've taken. I yeah, they will that. break down a water can 
like like a freaking cardiologist breaks down a, the heart, man. That is that is uh, crazy is. the way that they do their class. Uh, so I would hate myself if I didn't mention that, man. Uh, so if you get a chance to ever check that class out, go ahead. So go ahead, Sean. Sorry. No, you're good, man. I appreciate everyone's input. You know, you're not you're not cutting me off from anything. Um, so again, everybody can read; they understand. But the biggest thing to know is that. In order to be successful here in your VES, you have to train in VES, right? And this is not this is not something that you're going to probably assign uh, an, an experienced person. I'm not saying that they they won't or should never do it, but if you have the option, you, you probably want your most experienced firefighter performing this technique until that inexperienced firefighter can get a good grasp on it because it is highly aggressive. I'm not going to sit here and say it's dangerous because I'd be a hypocrite. I think it's everything we do is dangerous. Um, I think if we understand what it is that we're after in doing this technique, then it, it's fairly safe, uh, just like anything else, right? Advancing line into a house, putting out a fire. Like, yes, there are things that can happen, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you pay attention and you understand what it is that you're doing, um, it's a calculated risk. And, um, you know, there's a lot of debate about VES, like what are our roles? You know, should a person stay at a window? Should they, should both people go in? You know, should we use a thermal imager? Should we do this? Should we, I'm going to tell you, use whatever methods you feel are, is going to make you successful. All right. Um, I'm a firm believer in not having my partner at the window because I want my partner in there with me to split the room and search because one of us has to go to the door if there is one and isolate that, right? So while I'm searching on my way to the door, my partner can be in there with me, hopefully with a thermal imager, getting the layout and helping clear that space, right? Um, that would just be my preference. Now, head first, feet first. Again, uh, a debate that many people have. Um, at first, I was a head first only person. Yeah, I wanna go in and so that as I slide in the window, I can get my life fire layout you know, of the ground, and the more I do this, the more I realize that there is benefits to stepping in. Um, you know, understand that when you make that dive, you're committed, right? So when I step in, if something changes, maybe that door um, that isn't there, or maybe I couldn't get to it quick enough and the fire conditions rapidly change, that's that much quicker I can get out versus diving in, you know, and then having to go, oh, crap and then dive back out. So just some things to consider when when you're talking DES. Um, Pablo, I know you love DES. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, second floor VES is just, just food for thoughts, you know, like just it's a discussion. Do you, you know, do you have both, do you have the member going inside and, and, and one member uh, staying at, at the at the ladder. Do you have one member staying on the ground? Do you have both members inside the inside the room? Obviously, uh, I see what John put here on the chat about uh, depending on on room size, which is uh, a, a great note that 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 you can't room size goes a long way in understanding what you're going to do. Having said that, I actually uh, from from a second floor standpoint, and and you have let's say you're looking at the Bravo side of a structure or the or the Charlie side of a structure, and you have multiple windows up on the on, on a second floor and you have a ladder and, and you have a ladder thrown you know does the do you do more harm than good by going up to the, the, the as the second rescuer do you do more harm than good by going up to the to, to the to the to the window and staying on that ladder you know uh if your partner has to bail out because conditions got rough you're on the ladder um if you were um uh if, if you're on the ladder uh, you don't see the other windows. Maybe there's maybe there's someone on the other on the other windows. You know, with a little with a little wave, like, hey, help! I'm in I'm in this window. You don't see that. So maybe when you're from from when you're on the ground, um, maybe you're able to scan the the the, the, the side of the house a little bit better. You're you're able to look at the at, at the at the other windows to see what's going on. See what's going on in the eaves. Uh, is the fire in the attic? Is it you know are conditions getting worse? Um, so just uh, food for thought on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's, you know, everyone's got a different approach, you know, depending on how often you've done it or, or, you know, maybe the way that you were taught or, or shown, or maybe even the way you modified it for your frame. Right. And what I mean by frame is like you as the individual, you know, if you got long arms, you might be able to get a better push. If I got short arms, I might actually have to grab stuff differently. Right. So 
it, it's good to get that insight from from everybody, you know, because when we're talking about learning and teaching, I don't want anybody to take what I say or anybody else instructor or any of these other instructors and what they say and say, well, that's the way it's got to be because it certainly right. isn't. This is just our way. This is our preference. But I want, I do want you to take it into training and, and try it out and see what works for you, what doesn't. And if you like something that maybe doesn't work the way it does for me or anybody else, modify it. Use, use that in conjunction with another technique and, and maybe find your own way. You might find out that that's better. And then you can teach that to other people. So um, definitely not trying to say that it has to be one way or the other. Sean, you're absolutely right. You got to try it both ways or every single way that you can. Uh, when teaching about saws and cutting saws, I go back to riding a skateboard. You just have to go goofy footed sometimes, right? Yeah. All right. Goofy yeah. footed. Some people don't know what that is. You got to, you got to use your less dominant side. So yeah. sometimes a saw will put you up against the edge of a roof. You can't cut it like you normally do. So you got to be able to use it with your other side. You got to get ambidextrous with what we do in, in the fire service. I, I completely agree. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Thank you for adding that in there, John. Well, then it's funny because you, you see them do the firefighter dance where they're trying to find that comfortable position and they're, they're just wasting time. And then you get firefighter frustration marks. Yeah. <laughs> on, on the forever. yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at even something as, as the Denver drill, how many times has that been modified and changed and, mm -hmm. and shown that we could have done, done it a multitude of ways and accomplish the same results. So. Um, because there's something that's going to show up and throw a monkey wrench in the normal way we do it. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to have the toolbox and plans A, B, C, and Z just yeah. to get it done because something else is going to go wrong because it can go wrong. Yeah. And, and I love that you put that, that term toolbox in there because one of the things that I absolutely hate is when people use it, but they don't know what it means, right? We'll do a training or something. We're like, oh, another tool for the toolbox. What did you learn? What is it? Yeah, okay, I'm going to tuck it away for later and never train on it, but it's yeah. in the toolbox. Because in order for it to be in your toolbox, you have to use it and you have to know what it's used for. Otherwise, it's useless, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't look at a carpenter or a mechanic or whatever and have a bunch of tools. And when you say, hey, what's that for? I don't know. It's just another tool in the toolbox. They understand Great. the why. Yeah. Right. But the application is the most important part. Anybody Rep can understand the why for anything. Reps and sets equals muscle memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so here we are, as of the survey, uh, over 200 documented rescues from doing VES. That's since the survey started. You know, that to me, that's a lot. That's a pretty good number. You know, um, that's that's a win. That's that's somebody that we were able to pull out from an environment that was going to kill them. So survival rate when we do a VES, almost 50 percent. That that. Is a, is a great finding because that just further proves that the quicker we get in there and we go and we can assess these areas, whether it be systematically or, or maybe going beyond the door in, in that effort, we got in there quick. And that's what adds um, the benefit to our victims of surviving. So the last known line of duty death was actually in 1989. All right. Um, that was out of New York City. South Tower Ladder 131. All right, Firefighter Devaney. He was operating as the outside vent man on a four story uh, building. And there were uh, reports of a mother and children trapped on the fourth floor. So, being the OV man, his crew takes the roof. They find the mother and the children, never gets relayed back to him. He takes the window on the third floor, operating above the fire, goes in and searches. Um, Relatively quickly after that, the room flashed over and caused him to have uh, second and third degree burns all over his body, which were fatal to him. So um, that is what caused him to perish in this fire. But there's a couple of things that we were able to take away from this VES. Uh, if you read the report, and I'll drop that in the notes, it wasn't even documented as a VES. But knowing what we know, we're able to determine that. So uh, Jordan, if you would just go one more slide, please. Yeah. So here's the building. Okay, this is the layout. There's a VES location on the third floor. Fire floor was right there on floor two. Victims were found on floor, uh, the fourth floor, right? So as you could see, he was operating above the fire. That is a very, I don't want to say dangerous, but 
that has to be calculated appropriately. Otherwise, what we learn from that is that fire is going to do what? It's uncontrolled, right? It's not being suppressed. It's going to make its way path of least resistance, which is now that open window that is at that VES location on the third floor, right? So the furnishings that are inside that building also matter at this point because if they off gas quickly and they light off, well, now you're trapped, right? So understanding that what you do or what you don't do has consequences. Um, Go one more floor or one more slide, please. So here's what we learned from it, right? Passing by, and Pablo talked about this last time, we don't ever want to pass by fire. That's not what we advocate. But uh, passing by or going above uncontrolled fire can be deadly, um, right? The auto exposure from this fire is what trapped that firefighter on the third floor. Mm -hmm. This was a very risky VES. And honestly, when I'm looking for victims, I, I probably would have done the same thing that he did um, because you're in search mode. However, what we failed to do was realize like how much time do I have, right? That's where we go back to bagging our fire. I know where the fire is being because it's underneath me. And I know as soon as I take this window, that's where it's going to be at. And I know if I don't make this search quickly, you know, coupled with fire attack, well, now we know where it's going, right? So, the biggest thing that I want to tell people here is when we're in search mode and we're searching for victims, whenever we have a report that victims have been found, we need to make sure that those are not victims that we're still searching for. Right. Yeah. This firefighter went in that third window or that third floor apartment building because it wasn't relayed down that the mother and her children were already rescued from members of his company on the fourth floor. Right. So he's still thinking that they're trapped. And that is where that that lack of communication can get us in a jam. So anything else anyone have to add? Nope. All right. So we've hit on this a couple times. Uh the ES beyond the door. Right. Does everybody know what that means? Is is this kind of foreign news to, to anybody? Or is somebody heard of it in some way? So what it, what it generally is, is when we go ahead and we do a VES, what we're saying is that we're, we're starting a search, right? That's where our search is initiated from. Now, we are often trained to do what? Go in and come out, repositioning ladder, go in the next one, come out and do that. How much more effective can we be if we don't do that and we assess our environment, right? This is where me personally, this is why I like my partner with me. Because if I get to that door and we've isolated it and we've cleared this room and there's nobody there, I'm going to open that door back up and I'm going to assess my environment. If I have rooms that are relatively close by and I can make that search happen, I'm going to do that. So now I've transitioned from my VES to a uh, sure. primary search. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now people go, oh, well, you're moving through the structure and you know, you need, you know, that's freelancing. No, because we all have radios and we can say search crew to command, be advised. DES room is clear. We have tenable conditions in the hallway. We're initiating a primary search from DES location. Now they know where you are, right? So we go in and we do what? We isolate ourselves behind that closed door like we are taught and we search. Now you can leave somebody in the hallway to monitor, monitor conditions if you want to or you can bring them in that room. That is totally your choice. Um, but the whole point of moving through this structure this way is to constantly assess, okay, now I've cleared this space, can I move on further? If you can't, that is where your search is, that's where your search ends, right yeah. there. You've done as uh, much as you could. From a, from a private dwelling standpoint, from you know, and, and our bread and butter, especially down here in, in, in my area, if I'm the if I'm searching inside and 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 Duffy, you're you know you're let's just say you're outside, you're at that window or whatnot, and I and I do a quick and I and I get in in that in that room, I get low, I scan, I get to the I get to the hallway, and I want to do a, v, a VES beyond the door. All I got to do is bump Sean up, 
hey, Sean, come up to me. Sean, come up to me. Sean comes, in, Sean comes inside. He bumps up. And we do, we're doing essentially a, a primary search just from the outside. It goes from a VES from a primary search where we're, we're still having that Orient man sitting at that, at that doorway, monitoring conditions, et cetera, et cetera. I just bump him up from the window to the doorway so I can do my, so I can do my, uh, my, my hallway search or, my, or the other room search or whatnot. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really the thing is what else does that, that give us the ability to do? It gives us the ability to gain intel, right? So if we have a hose line operating that building and we say, hey, we still have heavy fire up here, that tells us one or two things. They're either A, not at the seat of the fire, or B, maybe we have multiple fires to address, right? So we could very well need a secondary line. Um, so relaying that back to command or even your interior hose team is, is huge. Uh, there, there is a third thing that, that has a benefit to it as well. If we do find a separate fire, maybe this is an arson fire or whatever the case is, we now have the ability from the interior past that VES room to isolate that area of the fire if there's a door there and we can close it, which we report, hey, there's a fire behind this door or you know whatever the situation is. Point I'm getting at is by going beyond that door, we are now more efficient, not only as a search crew, but as an intel crew and really keeping tabs on us and everything else going on in that structure or places that people may not even be able to see. So to, to think about that, this is something that you really, really need to train on um, to, to operate efficiently. But I think if we can start doing this as a standard practice, uh, we'll start seeing a lot more wins when it comes to our victims or maybe even um, reduce damage to the structure, isolating the fires, things like that. All right, go ahead and move on, Jordan. So uh, Pablo and I, like I said, we worked at the same station for a while um, when we worked for the same county department. This is a house that was in our first due. This is a pretty standard construction on that side of town. What I always ask people is, you're showing up to this, pretend it's on fire. Where do you think your bedrooms are? Now, what most people tell me is, oh, on the other side of the garage. Right, there's an entranceway, there's a garage, there's a door that leads in, looks probably like a split floor plan. Yes, you are, you are half correct, okay? Right there in that front window, which most people would think is probably a dining room um, or maybe a living room, is actually a bedroom. So go ahead and switch the slide, Jordan. All right, there we are. So I know you can't really see it all that well, but number one, all these all these building or rooms are numbered one through four. Number one is that first that first bedroom. Your standard VES will probably work very well here. Um, now, if you go to room four, which is the master bedroom, and we do a traditional VES and we choose to keep one person at the window because that's what we were taught to do. Look at all this space that one person has to search by themselves, and look at that long hallway. Now. Oh, well, one person's at the window with a thermal imager and a flashlight so that they can mark their location and they can hear me. I'm going to tell you right now, depending on the fire conditions and smoke conditions, if there's a lot of smoke in that room, good luck. Yeah. Smoke is dense. I'm not going to hear you. And I'm definitely not going to see your light because it's going to reflect back, right? So the further I am away from that window, less likely I am to hear you or anything else. And now I'm in no man's land by myself. I'd much rather have you with me so that you can help guide me and we can be more effective. Now, if you look at the doors outside of there, there's that area that we can sweep, right? Well, we find people in living rooms and kitchens and stuff, right? We have, we have statistics to show that. So we would miss all that area if we did it. And then now if you bump down to room two or three, same thing, traditional primary or uh, BES. Once you break that plane of that door and you close it, look at all that space you missed. If we were to come in room three, take the window, go and do a VES, close that door and never open it and check to see what other spaces are around there, man, we just did a disservice to any victims that are either A, further down that hallway, or B, in room two. Because we're right there by the door that leads to room two and we've just left to do what? Reposition ourselves and come in a window when we were literally a foot or two away from being able to enter that space. So I just throw this in here for some orientation aspects of, of you to see why this is a beneficial tactic for us to start employing and that it does make sense and, and it, it is successful. 
All right, so these are just some indications that we want to take a, take uh, into consideration, you know, assessing our environment like we talked about. Um, and then making sure that before we extra, exit the structure that we check the hallway once more. Um, if the fire attack is getting a handle on things, then we're good. We can push forward. Now, if fire attack, if there's no fire attack underway or that body of fire is just too large, then we do need to be real with ourselves and say, hey, I can't make this happen. Maybe reverting backwards to that traditional DES method somewhere else in this structure is of benefit to me. So we talked about a little bit on removing a victim. Now we're going to talk about what we do when we find them. So we all do mid-A training, right? That is something that we're pre, well, I'd like to think that we're well-versed in. Um, and what do we always do? Mayday, mayday, mayday. We say it three times because the first time it may not have been heard. Uh, second time, it's almost like, wait, what was that? And by the third time, you're like, that is definitely a mayday, right? Well, we want to do the same thing with our victims. If I find a victim, I want somebody to know especially if we're split search, you know, um, or you might be in the room next to me. Victim, victim, victim. That third time, I am going to know, wait, somebody just said something. And that's going to make me pause and stop, right? It's no different than when you're in distress. They teach people, like, if you have a gun or whatever, you fired off three times, that's a universal sign for distress. Well, hey, I'm trying to communicate something, and it, my voice is muffled. I'm going to say it three times very loudly. Um, then we need to know, once we get there, we're going to do our 360 sweep around them, make sure there's no other victims that uh, need removal. But we also want to assess our need. Are we able to ventilate? Is that something we can do? Or do we even need to? Um, you know, so don't start or don't wait for a stop in radio traffic to start removing your victim. Just start. And then when you get a chance, either have somebody else do it for you or you get on the radio and do it when there's free moment. The longer we halt the, the progressiveness of trying to move that victim, the, the worse it is for them. So we found them. Great. Now we need to remove them in the most efficient manner and quickly without wasting time jabbering on the radio, things like that. So well, one more. There you go, Jordan. Thank you. So we want to include our location just like we do with a Mayday, right? Because what if we isolate ourselves behind a closed door and we're in this room and our last known room was our original VES location. I need to tell somebody I am now in this room with a victim. I broke out the window, whatever. I'm on side Charlie, come find me. Whatever it is that you need to relay, maybe you need a ladder, some sort of communication. Let somebody know where you are. That is huge in anything we do uh, in the fire service. Quickest way. All right, we talked about that. You don't want to bring them out the way you came if you don't have to. If there's a window right there, then take them out the window. Um, and then, you know, when we find victims, they're not going to always be unconscious. Before we start grabbing and getting all crazy, and we're like, ah, see if they can help you in some sort of way. Because if we can just, if, if they just need assistance, man, then it's better for us to do that and assist them out than it is for us to grab a hold of them. They're already panicked and scared, you know, we, we need to reassure them that we're there to help them, um, especially when it comes to children. It's really scary, our, our face masks going off and all the sounds and everything. So pay attention to that. But biggest thing is, depending on who you ask, when you find a victim, they're going to say, oh, you just take them outside. Look, I'm going to tell you, I've been in this structure. I know where things are at. I know what I searched. I know what I didn't search. So if I find a victim, I'm tossing them off, and then I'm coming back in and completing my search if I'm able to. Right. Um, if you're not because you're low on air, well, then, yeah, that's fine. But if you're able to do that, it's really imperative that we finish the search that we started. Um, and then obviously EMS care gets done outside with paramedics and EMTs. Right. Yeah. All right. Pablo, I know this is something that you're passionate about. So why don't I let you go ahead and uh, talk on on the two in, two out for a moment. <laughs> I mean, two, uh, literally two and two out, obviously, as we all know, uh, goes out the window um, unless we have, you know, if we have any type of uh, confirmed entrapment. And, um, well, we don't know, like John said earlier, we don't know it's vacant until we clear it. So um, I'm not going to, you know, I won't be too much of a dead horse on this. Um, we had a very high profile 
um, issue going on here in the state of uh, Florida uh, with a neighboring county. And um, obviously it got, uh, <laughs> yeah, it got addressed, it got addressed nationwide. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes it, we got to do what we got to do, boys, you know. So, I mean, I won't, I won't beat it too much because I, I I know the guys. I know the guys in that department, so I'll just I'll I'll stay away from that. Right. So <laughs> I respect that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the one one thing I'll tell about Pablo is if anybody knows what what he's talking about, that it is a good department. They got some really good guys. They just had a bad employee that made a bad decision. Okay. And you can work for the best department, and that's going to happen. You know. So I'm with him yeah. on that. Unfortunately, the outcome was probably less than desirable for any one of us. I, I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody to have to uh, encounter. However, getting back to the two in, two out, what I'm going to say is that even, I don't know how it is for anybody else, but here in the state of Florida, they changed that directive and they never even told us, right? It used to be like incipient stage fire, life safety, all that, that two in, two out can go out the window and they changed it to, it had to be a confirmed life hazard. Well, guess what? every fire I go to, I'm going to assume that there's a confirmed life hazard unless I have reason not to believe so, which Absolutely. probably not going to happen for me anyway, unless there's smoke and fire blowing out of every orifice of that building. However, I don't, I don't think you can see it, but maybe you can. It talks about here that nothing in this directive is meant to preclude people from making a search. So what I am going to say about two and two out is if you're going to tell me to follow this directive, then you better damn well know what that directive means. You can't tell me to follow something and then tell me that nothing in this directive is meant to preclude me from making a search. That doesn't make any sense because you just gave me limitations on when I could and couldn't search, but told me that this directive isn't meant to keep me from doing such. Come on. Yeah. And then we'll go to this next one, which is really my favorite because I like to stir the pot on this. Um, you know, because it's good positive discussion. Right here it says this letter constitutes OSHA's interpretation of the requirements. So now you're telling me that nothing was meant to preclude me from searching to begin with, and now you're telling me that this is just your professional interpretation. Well, guess what? You're not the one out on the street making grabs and and you know putting fires out and all that other stuff. So I really don't care what your interpretation of my job is because you don't do my job, right? How are you going to tell somebody that, hey, man, this is just how I interpret it, and then expect me to live up to that? You can't, right? That doesn't make any sense either. So my personal two pet peeves on the whole issue, um, by no means am I going to stand here and tell you to violate your department's SOPs or anything like that. Just food for thought to, to think like we shouldn't always just take things because that is one of the biggest reasons why people do not search. Two and two out. That's like the greatest fallback plan. I didn't have two and two out. Great. Yeah. So what you're telling me is you don't understand your job. That's really what you're saying. And you're using that as a fallback plan and we're allowing people to do so and people are dying. Right. And I'm just not okay with that. So, um, yeah. End of rant. Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks Chris for the link. Yeah. Well, if, if anything, and yeah, I, I agree with you. I won't talk about this. I, I don't do that kind of stuff. But it, it is one of the best learning tools. I, I mean, if it's not if it's not confirming what we're here talking about tonight, I, I don't know what is. I mean, literally, the you know you you've got a heavily involved structure in the front of the house, and the woman is in the back side of the house, still on the phone with dispatch, still screaming and yelling, saying, "I can hear him! I can hear him! I can hear him!" And unfortunately, you know, the, the events transpired the way they did, but it, it couldn't be a more perfect example of why we have to get a search done no matter what. Absolutely. And uh, I will say this real quick, and this probably goes to for every department from Key West to New York City right here, boys. The difference between us and that link right there to that department is that they just happen to get caught. Every department has guys like that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you do. And, um, you know, I'm not going to mention the department or any of that stuff, but I will mention this fire because Pablo, you brought up a good point. You just happen to get caught. You know, this happens all the time around the country where we don't make searches and people die and it's just never really put in the limelight the way it was in this particular instance. That's it. And, um, you know, I personally know of a fire in a department that I worked for that, uh, they waited and waited and waited to do the search until, you know, 
third and fourth engine were arrived on scene. And the question was, well, did you go in and, and get a light fire layout? No, there's heavy fire blowing out the window. Great. But was it just on the window? Right. And the more you talk about the situation, I'm not going to go into crazy details about it because it doesn't matter. But the more you questioned the situation, the more the picture was being painted that this was just a very heavily involved bedroom. But because they're on an ambulance, they can't search because there's no water on scene. And that pisses me off because you know what? If you're going to show up on a scene, whether you're on an ambulance or not, and you're going to take the, the step to put your bunker gear on, and at that point you are signifying that you are no longer medical and that you are fire personnel, and you better go do firefighting duties. And if you're not going to do so, then just stay in your truck or don't put your gear on. You know, um, Because there's no difference if you're standing in the yard with a full PPE and, and air pack on. If you're not performing any functions, yeah. you're useless. Right. Absolutely. Um, so and, and I don't say that to be malicious. I just say that because it's truly what I believe in. And I feel to be fact at that point, you're just an overdressed spectator. And, you know, I could take somebody who bought a, a firefighting costume at the, at the Halloween store and put them in that same scenario. And they're doing the same exact thing you are, but you're supposed to be the professional getting paid for it. You know, there, there is a fine line of when you need to be held accountable for what you do and do not do. Yeah. Um, so sorry for that long tangent, but we talked about, uh, Maydays, right? Project Mayday, it evaluated over 6,000 Maydays. And, and what they really found out is that by us occupying the interior, we actually saved the most lives. Uh, not only ours, but civilians, right? And if you look here on the statistics, anytime there was a Mayday, 36% of the time we self-rescued. Okay. That's good. You know, self-rescue is always a good thing. Call the Mayday and you self-rescue and you don't need it. Awesome. 27% of the time, you're rescued by another interior crew or your own crew, which means that those people are inside already operating in the building when this Mayday happened. So they were able to get to you quicker than saying Mayday, Mayday, Mayday and waiting for a writ team. If you're all the way down to the bottom, 7.5% were rescued by writ. So look at all those numbers. That equates to 90% or more of the time that a mayday happened, we were rescued by interior crews. Okay, and I'm not saying that that RIT teams or RIC teams, whatever you choose to call them, um, are not beneficial and not needed on the fire ground. They absolutely are. I'm just saying I think we rely too heavily on that role in our algorithm of the way things need to go, and it prevents us from doing searches. Oh, there's no two in, two out. We don't have a RIT team, so we can't do a search. Well, the statistics show that uh, if that is your worry, then, hey, if I've trained and I understand what my roles and responsibilities are, I'm more likely to be rescued by guys that are in this building with me than that writ team that you're waiting on. So um, just my opinion. So yeah. take it as, as for what you want. Uh, but that's what I got from that. So Justin McWilliams, uh, Nick Ledeen, all those guys, man, they're doing just tremendous stuff with Firefighter Rescue Survey, getting all the statistics for us and, and just really hitting it hard. And and if you get a chance and you haven't already, you really need to look those guys up and, and see what's occurring on our fire grounds. Um, putting them first is safer for us. We just showed you that with the, with the stats of the Maydays, right? 88% um, chance that with no RIT team, search crew will be rescued by the interior hose team, which means what? Fire attack and search simultaneously together are, are paramount, right? When you, when you support that, man, you got all the help you need. How many people does it take to put out a fire? The nozzle man, right? So you got at least one extra guy in there. If, if you're a two-man search team and you got a two-man host team and someone goes down, you've got another person that can come help you remove this firefighter from that situation while you're still suppressing the fire. That's huge. You know, that means you don't have to stop firefighting activities to now do a rescue of your own personnel. Um, you know, when RIT was assigned before search, 60% chance. So we went from an 88 to a 60%, not terrible, still over 50. I like those numbers, but you know what? I want to know that I have the greatest odds, and that's really what we're after. So uh, go ahead and go to the next one, Jordan. So if we want to make a difference on the fire ground uh, in this, like, uh, about three hours that we've been at this talking, it's really about making a difference, right? Uh, making a difference in ourselves and making a difference in the victims as well. So you got to constantly train 
and improve on your craft. You know, none of us are ever going to be perfect. We make mistakes and that's okay. But the training is where uh, we get better, right? Um, know the facts, right? Don't just take something someone said because it sounded cool or whatever. Or, oh, I don't know. That's just what I've always been told. Don't, don't just take that as standard. Challenge people. Find out why, right? It's okay to do that. You don't have to be like disrespectful and arrogant about it. But you should know why it is that you're doing what you're doing. Because if you don't, then why are you doing it in the first place, right? Um, biggest leadership fail, in my opinion when you ask that question, cause I said so great. Okay. That doesn't tell me anything. Right. I, I legit want to know why I'm doing this so that I can find out where I'm deficient and where I need to get better. Right. Because if I don't know why I'm doing something, I have no idea how it's supposed to be done in the beginning. So I adopt a, a them first mindset. Right? Everything we do, whether it be a medical call or a fire call or, or going to a traffic accident, whatever, situation we're there for it really is about them it's not about us so we need to make sure that our mindset is always one that puts them ahead of our own needs um you know you swore to do this nobody's forced you to be here you are here on your own free will you took that oath you put that badge on you did whatever you said at some point you said yes this is what i want to do so do some self-reflection um if it still is what you want to do and you need to get better, then hey, by all means, we all need to get better. Let's do it together. If you don't want to deal with any of it, then like I said before, that, that should be your gut check to, to find something else to do because it's not fair to punish the victims of an emergency because you don't care about what their needs are and you don't care about being a professional and you're okay with being you know, a minimalist and just getting by because you get a good pension you get to sleep, you get to eat, and all that good stuff. So mm -hmm. that's uh, pretty much all I got, really. You know. So if you want to go back to that one last slide, Jordan, go back one. So one after this one, right there. If you guys want to take a screenshot of that, do whatever.